Bulldog Unchained presents the one-on-one -on -one sessions. They will go one-on-one -on -one with the Great One. Tuesday, February 4th, 2020. This is the Bulldog Unchained Podcast. I'm your host, the King of Villains, Bulldog Malenko. This is the one-on-one -on -one sessions, and I am really excited about my guest today. I have with me one of the most humble, kind, intelligent guys I've ever met in my life, and he is, in my opinion, and I've said this many times, in our region of the United States, he is hands down the best guitarist I've ever seen. And that is Mr. Edward Sign. How you doing, brother? Oh, fantastic. With an intro like that, go on. <laughs> no, go on, go on. Yeah, right. <laughs> Dude, okay. So you manage more music slash more guitars here in Evansville, right? I'm part of the Brain Trust. Oh, okay. yeah. My my official title is ambassador. Okay. Well that's <laughs> that's more fitting, actually. I mean, it really is. Because Yeah, that's like I brand ambassador. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see that you, what you guys have done, like what you and Brent and everyone there have done with the more music, more guitars brand is impressive. Thank you. Like taking what was, you know, once a small mom and pop guitar shop in Evansville, Indiana, and now it's become a global brand. Yeah. We've really, we've really done a lot. Of, it all really is, uh, due to the hard work of everybody in the crew. You know, of course, it's from the top down, too. Uh, uh, but it's we're, I'm, I'm so fortunate to work with a really great group of people that, that care, that understand and believe that they really are part of something that's greater than themselves individually. Yes. And that vibe comes across to anyone who goes in that store. It's anybody that is close enough to go to more music go even if you don't play an instrument i promise you just walking in there talking to the people that work there you're going to want to get an instrument thank you for that you're you're going to want to and you're you're going to want that purchase to be done there it's like i felt i felt really bad having to get that gretch the way that i got it simply because you guys aren't a gretch dealer <laughs> like, you know you know sure if that gretch had been in your shop I would have just been like, okay, I'll pay on it however much I can <laughs> until I can get it out of jail. <laughs> no, I believe, I totally believe you. You know, uh, we can't carry everything. There's only so much, you know, budget and so much wall space. But we really do want anyone that is a, you know, to give us a shot as a customer to really just have a, a, an awesome retail experience, not even just a niche thing like guitars. You know, we want someone to walk into the store. And we're like, wow, this is this is an awesome place. Even if I'm not into guitar or anything, I see what you guys are doing. I understand, you know, how you're interacting with the customers. They can appreciate that, you know, we're all, uh, you know, really into what we're into, which is music and guitar and tone and playing. And it's enriched each of our lives individually. So that's one of the main things that we try to convey when we're talking to somebody about getting into a guitar, whether it's a you know a, a very young person or uh, someone who's retired and has free time, or whatever stage in your life is, music heals. And the guitar, I think, is the most it's the most democratic instrument in the sense that you know you don't have to study music theory in order to be accomplished. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's I mean, very true. Five chords in the right you know arrangement, you can win a Grammy. The the the, <laughs> the five main chords are the basis of most songs that have ever been written yeah you get all all six chords in the first in the first position and the minor variants you're playing beatles songs you're playing everything right. you're right. you know and the truth is it's it is hard you know it's a physically awkward instrument and um everybody has gone through that you you know you're right-handed you have to develop strength and dexterity with your left hand you don't do anything i'm not a lefty i don't do nothing right with my left hand you know, but that's where our, a lot of the action is on guitar, right? Yep. And, the fretting hand. Yeah. yeah. So that's where I feel like, you know, I often quote a league of their own. It's like, yeah, it's hard. It's, it is. That's what makes it cool. You know, otherwise everybody would be doing it. 
so you know you put your time into it and you know you, if you can play something on the guitar that means you've put effort into it and anyone that plays can appreciate that yeah what you said though about having a great retail experience in my opinion retail experience is a slight to what you guys produce there it really is like it's a retail experience is getting hawked going to guitar center that's yeah for for my opinion that's that's a retail experience like it's the walmart of instruments like you okay yeah you got a great selection you've got good stuff there you got two people in the building that know what the stuff is the rest of the people there are just trying to sling stuff out the door whereas coming into your place dude first of all just the attitude of everyone that works there and how they interact with anyone who comes through the door like even as many times as i've been there most of the times when you see me come through the door you know bulldog ain't there to buy anything i'm coming to check out a pedal or i'm coming to play a specific guitar just to see if i like it things like that and no matter what it's still hey bulldog what's going on man yeah what do you, you want to check out today and that's that's amazing thank you i mean that's that's what that's what the owner of the store brett Mulzer, wanted he wanted people to feel comfortable that this is you know it's really trying to capture the experience that he had when he was a much much younger man going to abc music and seeing like you know innis there or or you know uh uh you know you know guys like you know kevin book that that really you would look up to because yeah they're talented you know they can play then that's when you're uh, you know, very young it's impressionable and you could see you know i still remember when i was seeing people play the guitar and being like wow i mean i still have that experience but you know it's like i have that experience <laughs> every time you post a new video from more music on on facebook and i'm just like god i hate him how how did like he's he's not even paying attention to that guitar he's like staring off to see if somebody just walked in the door and he's just playing these beautiful melodies and riffs and me i have to stare well now I'm, now i'm getting better at it where i can kind of look around whenever i play certain things but most of the time i'm deadlocked on that fretboard like okay this here 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 yeah and <laughs> See, you know, and that's a major that's a major uh, milestone and accomplishment because it's muscle memory, and that's one yeah. of the things with guitar. That's the probably the hardest thing for people to realize that the practice comes from repetition. And once you get to the point where you've done this repetitive action many, many times, you don't have to look at what your fingers are doing. As a matter of fact, your body has already ergonomically figured out the most efficient way to do this action. And that's why athletes. A lot of athletes are, are you know, play or musicians. You know, the great Bernie Williams of New York Yankees. You know, he's a you know wonderful guitar player, and I think it's that same type of training that athletes or martial artists or you know people who are who are customers of mine that that are physical and they understand like oh if I do that enough times then if you say muscle memory or right. if you say mechanics yeah, yeah then they get it then it's like oh, okay I just have to put in the work. And, you know, once you're at, that's a major milestone. Again, if you're not looking at your fingers, that's, yeah. Well, one thing that helped me was I stumbled across a video of a guy that was, it was kind of like a TED Talk mm -hmm. sort of scenario. <clears throat> and he brought this dude, brought a guitarist on stage. And he said, just play me something that is one of your favorite things to play. And this dude starts playing and it's beautiful. And he goes, that was great. Now do me a favor. Don't move your fretting hand at all. Just either rest it on your lap or just hold on to the neck of the guitar and only move your picking hand and pick like m do the movements that you did when you were playing that song. And the dude started and he goes, "I I cannot figure out how to do this for the life of me." And he goes, this is what I'm going to introduce everyone to right now. He was like, your fretting hand is your control hand, not your strumming hand. He's like, the strumming hand is an afterthought. And he goes, what you need to do is make your brain learn to balance both. He was like, yeah, you might be able to play something because you're paying attention to your fretting. Meanwhile, your picking strumming hand is an afterthought. He goes, when you start making your brain realize every movement that both hands have to make consciously, so he makes this guy repeat it 
keep doing it for like five minutes. And then he goes, okay, now go back to actually playing it. Don't strum. He was like, go back to actually fretting it. Don't strum. And you can just hear it coming through the guitar and everything. He's, everything's really good. And then he goes, now, what I want you to do is start fretting it again and then stop fretting it and just keep your strumming hand moving. And as soon as he did that, the guy is still keeping the pattern going with his strumming hand. And you could just see on his face that it clicked. Man, I practiced that for probably three days, doing it like 20 minutes a day. And all of a sudden, things started improving. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, it was a, a different approach to the mechanics of it. For whatever reason, my brain went, oh, okay. And I think that I was just getting too involved in what was frustrating me mm -hmm. and not letting both of my hands work together enough. Like I was trying to put the focus on my fretting instead of easing off of that and putting some of that focus into strumming also. And for whatever reason, it just like clicked and now things have gotten a little bit different with my playing that's great i mean there's so many different ways and different approaches is, approaches that will work for everybody and that's why when i when someone says hey, i had a teacher and it wasn't working out it's like well get another teacher you know it's chemistry <laughs> you know it's you know a lot of it is also being honest with yourself and what you want to try and accomplish you know don't be afraid if you're into metal don't be afraid of it <laughs> that's what you want to play then you do that you know that's the problem. I love blues. And I had this misconception that when I started playing blues, I was like, oh, this is easy. I mean, anybody can play blues until you start listening to some of the stuff that, you know, John Lee Hooker, or Johnny Winters. Jesus, what? what? Yeah. That's not natural. Those movements aren't natural for people to make with their hands. That dude's doing like five fret stretches with his fingers. And that's people don't do that. And I'm like, okay. You also have to own certain things that you might not be able to do. <laughs> <laughs> He's got eagle claws, man. I, I don't understand. Like, you do it too sometimes when I see you play stuff. You do these reaches. And I'm like, I mean, if I did that, my, my hand just advanced arthritis by five years. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this. How old were you when you picked up your first guitar? Well, I always had guitars in the house. My my parents weren't musicians, but you know, my father was always was really into music, and so was my mother. But my dad, my father had guitars lying around the house, some acoustics. I don't know, maybe some, some you know, this is New York in the '70s, and he owned a dry cleaners in Greenwich Village. Maybe some people owed him money, and they gave him a guitar. I don't know, but <laughs> there were these acoustic guitars in the house, and he did buy me a Telecaster from Manny's Music when I was like three years old. And a Fender Champ amplifier, and I never messed with them until I was to got to be twelve years old. I mean, I wanted to be a drummer, and that was just not happening in a one bedroom apartment <laughs> at Thirty Third Street. Um, but that's what I was really into. I was always banging on the couch, playing along the you know records and and banging on the couch. But the, the guitar, I stopped banging on the guitar with a drumstick when I was twelve, and that's when I was like, okay, I'm gonna try this out. <laughs> Wow. So ever so, since then, really. So at 12 years old, you start playing. Yeah. Like, did you take lessons? Like, how did this? Not till work? I got, not till I got a little bit older. Did you have any of the books? No, nah, it didn't work for me. Did you I go the was, Mel Bay route? No, no. <laughs> I, I probably never would have learned how to play guitar. <laughs> right. But that's, I'm, I'm fortunate. I've, I've, I've been around guitar players better than me my whole life. And even at 12 years old, it was, I met a, uh, a a friend of mine I'm still friends with. His name is Blue Wilding, and he's uh, you know he's one of my oldest friends and guitar buddy. And he was already playing guitar a little bit. So um, in the seventh grade, you know, it, that's one of the things about guitar. You you start playing it, then you'll meet other people, you know, and then all of a sudden just go into the shop to get strings. Yeah, can turn into. Yeah. Hey, let's gig. Let's yeah. Get, or let's, let's, let's out get together. together. Yeah. You know, guitar players, fellow guitar players are just friends that haven't met yet. Right. You know, and and I got lucky in the seventh grade with a with a with a kid my age that already could play a little bit. 
and then that same thing happened once I got to high school. You know, at high school, then I was around a couple of really great guitar players, like ridiculous. And um, I took a couple of classical guitar lessons because I thought Brandy Rhodes and like that was the the direction for me to become a more accomplished guitar player. But that didn't work for me because classical is very, very regimented, and and I didn't know any better. And that's when I got introduced to uh, jazz music. And at 16, I didn't know anything about jazz, but I knew that I was serious about playing guitar. So every day after school, I would put on WBGO Jazz 88 out of Newark, New Jersey. And I just put on the radio and I'd listen to it. And I was like, I got to learn how to appreciate this. So I was really deliberate in soaking up jazz music and then getting turned on to different guitar players and discovering fusion. And then it's like, oh, here's a guy that definitely works in the jazz idiom but he's shredding too and there's some definite blues you know so yes. you know in high school i got turned on to um uh scott henderson it's a wonderful our, our my buddy sean needham just saw him in chicago the other night it's like i'm really jealous it's scott henderson uh carlos rios was in chicory electric band and this is the stuff in the late late 80s all right around that time yeah uh, mike stern and that's really what I was listening to. I, I stopped listening to metal at, at 86, <laughs> you know, because then it got real corporate. There was a time before, you know, I you know, knew the MTV oh, yeah. it got really, really bad. You mm-hmm. know, it got really corporate. It didn't pick back up until about the early to mid 90s. And then that's when it when dudes it, really started to rebel against the, the grunge thing happening. And they were like, screw this. We're gonna go even harder than what it was before. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, so I just that's how I started playing guitar. Just a love of music. Fortunate to be around some really, really talented guitar players, more more accomplished than I, and just being a sponge. You know, I say I come from the hunter gatherer school of guitar players. I will rip off everyone's lick. You play around <laughs> me, and if I like it, I'm gonna take it. And right, I'll make it my own. That's, but that's what every great guitarist has done. Like everyone's been inspired by someone else. And they they got started, you know, like being influenced by that's unless you're the one of the first 500 people to pick up a guitar in the history of the world. You've been influenced by someone else to pick up a guitar. That's really true. And I got into figuring out I got into listening to my influences influences. And that's how I became a really active listener of music. I listened to it's like, oh, well. So Steve Harris in this interview of Iron Maiden, he was like, he he told a story when he was a teenager, he had uh, a denim jacket with the Genesis album Foxtrot painted on the back of it. And I was like, Foxtrot, Genesis, Dude, Steve Rutherford. Harris, what's the Mike connection? Mike Rutherford is a monster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I bought I bought a cassette of I found it, bought it, and it was and discovered you know Genesis with Peter Gabriel and that you know because in the in back the, in the weird Peter yeah, Gabriel days, and like man. I said, Mike Rutherford, you know, like Peter Gabriel. I am fully convinced, and he's never said it, but I'm fully convinced that Peter Gabriel was the main inspiration for Maynard James Keenan from Two. Oh, that's a great observation. I get the cra- it. Like the geisha totally. outfits I never on stage, about the that. crazy things he used to do. Never like thought about Like a lot of people that. don't right. know about Peter Gabriel when he was in Genesis. Pe- yep. People think Peter Gabriel and they're like big time yeah. and sledgehammer. Pop stuff, which is great. Right. But- it's amazing. But Peter Gabriel was crushing the edge. He wasn't and he wasn't a uh like he wasn't dancing on the edge. Like he just hopped off the edge and was doing things at a time that people were uncomfortable. Was, yeah, with. yeah. Wow, that's a really yeah. Maynard and, and Gabriel. Yeah, I get it. Pushing the line. Yeah. Like, yeah. I love. Look, when anytime people talk about, I call it Genesis and Company because you got like Peter Gabriel or you got Genesis. You got Peter Gabriel. You got Paul Carrick. With Mike and the Mechanics, right. and then Paul Carrick by himself. You got Phil Collins. You got all of these things that tie in together. So I call it Genesis and Associates. Yeah. And first of all, like when you listen to uh, Peter Gabriel's, like that that first solo album, one of the main things that I love that that was pretty much the creation of gated drums, and that was all Phil Collins. Yeah. And there are no cymbals, no hi hats. <laughs> no brass anything to do with drums go back i know you're sitting here trying yeah, to yeah. you're trying to yeah. imagine it none there's not a hi-hat crash not a cymbal crash 
it, it is that nasty gated drum with that reverb on it and it just sounded so ominous and menacing it's awesome stuff dude you're gonna go back you're gonna <laughs> yeah. go back and listen to that peter gabriel you could be like how the hell does somebody play drums without even a hi-hat because that's like a tempo thing for a lot of drummers yeah that's you know true. yeah and phil collins don't need none of that <laughs> yeah <laughs> phil collins can play five pickle buckets flipped upside down and still make it sound ridiculous yeah but, yeah, the influences influences. Yes. So you know, and that, that with Zeppelin, you know, just to reinforce, it was like that's how and and Doors, Zeppelin, the Doors got Willie Dixon, I Am the Blues. All right. Yep. That one album has got Backdoor Man. Same, I can't same thing babe. with Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. He, well, damn. He, he cites Willie Dixon. He also. That's how I discovered when I was a little kid and read a thing about Hendrix. That's how I found out who Robert Johnson was. Uh-huh. My life changed when I heard that dude. I was like, what is this? Oh, well, that's the turn of the century Mississippi Delta Blues. And I was like, whoa, that's... I was probably 10 or 11. Wow. When I found Robert Johnson, I was like, man, this dude's just singing about the devil and the crossroads and selling his soul. (laughs) He's got me hooked. Yeah. It's great nerding out to music lore and, and just figure out how, because that's when you're an active listener of music. That's what, I mean, someone that maybe you bought an album because you don't know what the band was, but you recognize the producer. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, or it was because, hey, I took a chance on something with someone who I do like said that, oh, this is a, an essential listening and you go for it. Um, you know, you end up getting to the point where you're listening to music that no one else you know is listening to, unless you meet someone and it's like, oh, yeah. You're totally down with that. Me too. Here's why I got it. Well, that's like, I knew who Richie Kotzen was vaguely. And I, I, I liked some of the things I'd heard. And then you turned me on to a whole bunch of other projects that he's done. And I was like, oh, he's well, such now a he's one of my artist. favorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's one of my favorite dudes. Like the, uh, the save, uh, save or save me. Yeah. It's a great tune from the damned. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah i i literally when i left the store that day when you were telling me about that i got in the car plugged my phone in pulled it up on youtube and was just listening to it on the way home and i was like oh my god yeah richie Cotson is one of those guitar players that has just got such a unique voice and is i mean literally he's a great singer uh but a wonderful guitar player i've listened to a lot of him um greg howe is another guitar player who the two of them work together yep. love greg howe and um you know ian thornley and big wreck i mean they just that was another one that you introduced yeah. me to yeah because you they were playing in the store yeah you were listening to it in the store and i was like what is this and you were like this is one of my favorite bands this is big wreck <laughs> yo you're gonna love this bulldog i was like i already do yeah that's one of the cool things about our job is that you know it's not like we have um corporate radio telling us what to listen to yeah it's like we put on whatever we want yeah. sometimes it's metal mondays and sometimes you know, it's really really cold so we're gonna play some reggae you know oh. just try and bring in some heat yeah it's fun it's a really cool environment and we get turned on to music by our customers all the time all the time it's like oh you should check this out so it's really great because it is part of a musical community and there's so much stuff out there and i mean how can one person Find it Take all. it all in. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. You, you, you can't. We got to rely on each other. Yeah, that's one thing that, okay, so this this will, I don't know if you've experienced this, but were you in the MySpace days? Yeah, yeah, that was a requirement of me joining Gonzo's right. Toy Box okay. back in the day. So back then, bands ha- were able to put songs on their profiles, yeah. like their music. So you could go to your favorite bands page or whatever. But the cool thing was those bands would be friends with other bands and they would have like their top 12 friends and they would put their bands that they were real close with or on tour with or getting ready to go on tour with. And you could click and just be like, oh, who's this? And then you're listening to their music all of a sudden. Man, I stumbled across so many things back then like that. And the other thing that now it's not like that anymore, but used to go on uh, Amazon and type in a band that you liked and pull up one of their album pages and then down below it was like if you like this check out and you could click on this band's page and you could play the songs on their page oh my god I found so many different just off the wall obscure bands that 
are amazing and I've tried to introduce people to and one of them that came into my peripheral view around 2009 or 10 I found Volbeat oh yeah before like before they were ever before they ever touched US soil you know they're from like Finland or whatever yeah and I heard this and I was like this sounds like Elvis and Johnny Cash had some three-way with Metallica when they were good and this bastard child crawled out of hell and now is making music and the first two albums from Volbeat I love love them now it's they've become corporatized and they are what they are and dude's still amazing but it's not my cup of tea anymore but I've tried I tried to make so many people listen to this and I know you've had this frustration too where you're like you need to check these guys out you need to check these guys out and then give it two three years and all of a sudden they somehow end up on the radio and, oh man have you heard this and you're like yeah three years ago when I tried to tell you about them jackass like, <laughs> I don't even like them anymore <laughs> oh but yeah man like the the finding of new music is that's like a key factor of my life yeah, between the algorithms and like Amazon, like we're talking about, or Spotify that introduced you to new music, uh, um, it's still it. I, you come across gems and stuff, but it's still really just from people that you know. I think you know, soft connections, but real human ones. Yeah, having someone actually recommend something to you. Yeah, yeah, that because what that says to me, like you know, people who aren't so thrown into music like like you and i like we throw ourselves into music it's just like music if you got the if you have the option of watching an awesome movie or tv show or listening to one of your favorite albums pretty much the music's probably going to win out right yeah most likely yeah 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 i mean that's what what it you know for for those of us who who are the type of people that get goosebumps from a song or a movement. You know, it's a visceral experience. It's something that nothing else can give you. And that's where music, you know, it's, they, they, they study the brain. I mean, all parts of the brain are worked in producing and, mu and listening to music. And that's why it's so therapeutic. And so when we have, you know, you know I, I, I'm, I'm a great adv advocate and have the opportunity to put guitars in people's hands and say, you can do this, you know, just be patient with yourself. You know, and whether it's a, a seven-year-old kid or a seventy-year-old, you know, adult, uh, you know, it's enriching, it's therapeutic in so many different ways at any time of your life. And I really believe music heals. I think music can evoke every possible human emotion. It's the only thing we have that can do that. Yeah. Like, you could be, you could listen to one song that you know is going to rip your heart out. And you know it's going to make you feel just this this heart-wrenching emotion. And you know that you can put on another song that actually makes you laugh. Yeah. And your your mood is going to shift almost instantaneously. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, visual arts can do a lot too. But with music, it's it's definitely something that, that's magical. It's those... It's even, even without lyrics, just tones... Tones manipulate. Oh yeah, like like the dude uh, Chase Holtz Holtzfelter or whatever. This dude, he's a YouTube guy. He does popular songs in A minor. <laughs> he takes these. He can take the happiest, most upbeat song. He converts it to A minor, and it will become one of the most destructive, heart wrenching songs you've ever heard. He did a version of Creedence Clearwater's uh, Fortunate Son. Dude, that song is really upbeat, even though the message of it is kind of, man, that's yeah. that's rough. But when you listen to it and you hear that guitar and you hear the drums, you can't help but your head's just bobbing and you, you feel good listening to CCR. You know, it's one of those like, John Fogarty's voice was just cool. And then you hear him sing it in A minor and you're like, this song got serious real <laughs> quick, man. This is bad. Uh, isn't it the saddest of all keys? 
Yeah, that's that's why he does it. <laughs> he he takes these really upbeat, popular songs. Dude, he did "Kiss the Girl" from Little Mermaid, uh-huh. and did it in A minor. And it's like, this isn't fun anymore, man. I don't want to <laughs> listen to this. This just sounds like a desperation. Like this dude's on his last limb trying to get this girl. It's like, oh my god, <laughs> how how did he figure this out? <laughs> it's I love stuff like that though. And I like another guy that just has that knack for that. You know who uh Ray Lamontaine is. I'm familiar with the name, but not no. He does a cover of Crazy by Gnarls Barkley. Okay. You know CeeLo Green? Yeah, the, sure. I think you're crazy. <laughs> he plays it on his acoustic, tones it down. And I'm telling you, Ed, if you heard this, you would instantly think well, CeeLo Green should never sing that song ever again. Wow. And his voice is so gravelly and just gritty, and it just changes it. And he's not singing it all upbeat, and it's no, it's not a pop song anymore, man. It's a, oof, man, that's heavy. Wow, wow. <laughs> so, all right. You're, so you get into high school. Like, were you in any bands in high school? Yeah, I, I, I jammed with a couple of guys. Um, I didn't really... My first real band was, was... I was still in high school, but I wasn't really... I was with... I was with... I was playing with guys that were 25 and 30. And it was a good experience for me, but, you know, that's a, that's a big difference in age, you know? Right. So, for me, the, the immature spots were really still showing. And, and I had some good experience, but... Um, you know, I've always played in bands, but never like performed. You know, you know it was a, the thing to do was to go to the thirtieth, go to thirtieth Street and rent a studio and jam with your with your friends. And you know, it's not until for me it, it wasn't until I got older that you know in my early twenties where it's like okay, here's now I'm with musicians that are my age now, and uh, we're actually writing music. You know. So in high school, yeah, I, I was, but it wasn't like I was out gigging and going to high school and stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's that's a that's a big change too, a big transition. Like, I know a lot of people start out in cover bands and such, and then a lot of them make that transition and start doing original music, and you realize really quickly these songs that you love and that you love to play, they took real fucking work to make and flesh out yeah and most likely the finished version of the song you love went through 15 to 20 transformations to get there that they performed over a year or two until they got it right and they liked it to where it was okay let's record this and put it on the album yeah yeah i kind of for me it was the opposite i didn't play covers until i uh, played a cover until i moved to evansville much later in, in, in my life. But See, that's that's probably a good thing to your benefit, though. Suppose, yeah, I I, I got a, had a lot of experience being in, in in a in a band, and when you're tr- when you're playing original music, um, first no one knows when you make a mistake because it's all new yeah, for the most part. Exactly, and you're really trying to get something across. So yeah, yeah, when I play in playing covers. You know, I take it very seriously because this song, it may not be my favorite song, but it's someone else's favorite song, possibly. And I'm not going to do a disservice to that person or or disrespect the original songwriter by trying to, you know, think I could just mail, you know, fax this in and, and, yeah. and BS my way through it. That's, you know, that's not rock and roll. <laughs> that's definitely not rock and roll. So... I did come. I did come to playing covers with. All right, I want to entertain, but I also want to not, you know, uh, like really, literally, that's just just ruin something for somebody. I get that, man. I respect that. That's that's actually a great attitude to have toward that. I feel like because um, I'm not like when I was, you know, I've been in a couple cover bands, and there are just songs that you hate. You may personally hate. However, your perspective changes when you perform that song, especially if you do a really good job performing it and people react to it and they come up and they're like, man, I'm so happy you did that song. It's like in your brain, you're going, God, I hate that song. And But outwardly you go, 
I'm glad you had a good time. I'm glad oh, you yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah, because it's that I'm, I'm it's a it's a privilege to be an entertainer. The first one that pops out in my head is "Crazy Bitch" by Buck Cherry. If, <laughs> I, if I never have to hear that song ever again in my life, perfect. If I never have to sing it, even better. Like it's, <laughs> I know it's one of those songs that won't go away, and it's always requested, God. and it's like, honey, this song's not about you, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you it's, you need to hear this tonight. So. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's that's where where um, you know playing covers, you know rock covers. I mean, I mean it's in jazz they're called standards, right? In yep. classical music it's called you know the opus. It's the work. It's it's the the music that we're playing now. Especially say you do a song like "Don't Stop Believing." All right, now not everyone has had the opportunity to see Journey. Right, and maybe they only heard this song in their earbuds or something. But if it's a song that's executed well by a band that really is doing it justice, you know, it can be transformative for somebody. Yep. You know, so the context in which the music is listened to is really important too, because that's where the difference between all right, I've heard Crazy Bitch a billion times, but now I've heard this band. This band's rocking it. Whoa, okay, yeah. It's, you know, then you get the whole magical element of what it's like to go to see a live rock band. You know, that's and that's. Hopefully it's um, contagious, you know. Well, now we're leading up to that. When did you move to Evansville? Uh, May of '99. So, what brought you here? I fell in love with a West Side girl. <laughs> <laughs> how'd you How'd you meet? Um, my wife was a flight attendant for American Airlines. I was in a band in the early 90s, and a couple of guys were dating flight attendants. So we had this group of flight attendants that we would socialize with, and I got lucky. Yeah, That's awesome. Dude, I've, I've known you for years. I've never heard this. Yeah. That's it's, crazy. It's, that's it. I really got lucky. You know, most, you know, a lot of guys I knew got hooked up with strippers. <laughs> you know, I met a nice girl <laughs> from Evansville. <laughs> So you come here in 99. Yeah, I knew what I was getting into. I had been visiting the area since, you know, we've been together since 90, the early 90s. So I knew what, what it was going to be. I knew where I was moving to. Right on. And, I, and you know, I, I, I um, you know, grass, trees. I, wanted, I didn't want to live in a suburban type of environment. So, you know, I live out in the country and, you know, I, I've got you know enough space and distance from the road where it really is the country. Yeah, you know, it's great star watching weather. You know with the clouds are are not around and it's all kinds of crazy. And there's not light pollution. Not a lot. Yeah, yeah, where I live. Yeah, it's really really gets really dark and it's nice. So coming home after a gig at two o'clock in the morning, you can see a lot of cool stuff on a clear night. Yep, it's really nice. That's awesome. So when you get here in '99, like how how quickly did you jump into a band here? Right away, it was pretty neat. I knew two musicians when I moved here, Scott Winsinger and Nick Gregory. And um, I, I, I got hired on by Pat Moore, Moore Music, like, right away. And I, uh, once, I, once I established myself here and moved here, you know, Nick was a really gracious and great friend. And he was like, yeah, you want to put together a band? Sure. You know, let me call up my buddy Jeff. And so we put together a trio and rehearsed and started gigging. Pretty much within the first, I would say, the first six months that I moved here. And which band was this? We called it Fountainhead, I think. Um, we used to play a lot at the Boiler Room in Owensboro. Right on. And so uh, that, that's where, um, that's really where the first band where I got started. And yeah. then was there anything between that and Gonzo's? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I, Working at the music store was how I met the people that I needed to meet here in Evansville. You know, this is before social media, right? So right. networking was actually going out and meeting people and putting going yourself to, out yeah, there. Yeah, going to club shows yeah. here. And, yeah. and so if someone said, hey, you want to sit in? And never saying no. Like, it's like, yeah, it's an opportunity. I didn't know anybody. Um, uh, yeah, I was in a band called Six Hills Giant. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And With Greg uh, and... Well, that actually uh, in the band it was Elvis yeah. and um, or uh, not Greg um, Kevin Evans on bass, Walt on drums. This what? was at, this was pre Walt, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, um, 
Yeah, it was because Walt Walt was in the band, but when I was in the band on drums, is he's gonna kill me because I'm just having a brain fart right now. Um, <laughs> Anyway, somebody else. <laughs> It'll come back to me. <laughs> and he and Elvis have been friends for years and stuff. But I apologize. I'm just having a having a a, a senior moment. But uh, yeah, I was in that, I was in that band for you know a good a year and a half. The first time I played at Gonzo's tour and at, played at Fast Eddie's was in Six Hills Giant. We did had gigs at uh, Marina Point too. So it was cool. Like, we got to play the big rooms. That's awesome. Yeah. And then after that, is that when Gonzo's came about? That was, a, yeah, that was not long after that. Um, and uh, even before that, I was in a band called Vegas Radio. And that was fun because the guitar player, but it was, it was a trio with the, another guitar player. And we didn't want to wait to find a bass player. So we'd switch back and forth on guitar and bass throughout the <laughs> night. And that was, That's people cool. dug that. Yeah, yeah. that was, had some show, show you know, quality to it. Um, that was a lot of fun. A wonderful guitar player named uh, Mike Fisher, and uh, uh, a lot of acoustic gigs and stuff like that. Gonzo's Toy Box. I remember the day uh, <laughs> I asked Fred Hunt. He was at the store. He came in and buy some strings or something. And I was like, "Hey, how's so how's everything going? How's the band?" He goes, "What do you mean?" <laughs> and that was the first <laughs> that's, intimation that that's they were Fred. looking. You know, uh, uh, um, that's the that's where the the first hint was like, "Okay," and um, I auditioned, and then you know like some months went by and I guess they were trying to work things out. And then I auditioned again and, um, and yeah, I got the gig and, and that, that my first gig with them was like the week after the week after new year's Eve at fast Eddie's in 2008. And I remember that because it was a, it was, it was a packed house. It was, you know, Gonzo's toy box was an established oh, band yeah. at this point. And they had already been going for, you know, since 2000, I think. Yeah, when I moved home in 2005, like, I was like, what, are, you know, I've, all my friends are hooking back up with me. And I'm like, what are we doing on a weekend? Like, you know, Friday night's coming up. What's going on? And they're like, Gonzo's is playing Fast Eddie's. And I'm like, what's a Gonzo? And <laughs> okay, we'll go to Fast Eddie's. That's fine. What's Gonzo's? Gonzo's Toy Box. What the fuck is that? And we went, and that was when... It was Dave Jama. and Jama. Yeah, and I was just blown away. I was like, what? How is this band existing in Evansville? And then I used to, like, after I got to know them a little bit, I used to ride them all the time. I'm like, why are you not doing original music? You have so much talent on this stage right now. Why are you not writing originals? And we get to get that a lot. I mean, um, we actually did do perform two original songs uh, at one point, two that I, that I wrote, and at least one or two that Fred wrote. But um, that was it was tough because I mean, this was a working band. I mean, every right. weekend we were playing, and, and they were a high dollar band too. Yeah, they, they Gonzo's like, got paid well they for did. gigs. Yeah. <laughs> And 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 they started from like playing at Mexican restaurants yep. uh, out of town, lugging their own PA. They earned, you know, it was no mystery to me why they were where they were. They earned hustled. They earned it. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's where we first met. I think at, when you got up at Woody's or something, or yep. you know, because Mark was that kind of guy too. You get people up the, there. Mark, to yeah, sing, Mark man. used to pull me like the 2005 through 2007 range. It was pretty much a given. That almost every weekend you would find Bulldog at Gonzo's Toy Box gigs, and I'm either going to be singing Cult of Personality by Living Color, yeah. or I'm going to be me and Mark together would do Walk by Pantera, uh, yeah. or they'd have me get up and sing White Zombie, Thunder Kiss '65, you know, just whatever. And Mark always looked like he he was so gracious about it. It was never a oh somebody's getting my spotlight. It was oh cool I get to take a break for a song or two now. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> It was part. It was great. It's part of the show, and, and, and yeah, he was very generous that way. Um, and yeah, I remember seeing other people get up and play guitar for certain songs. And I'm like, that's cool, man. Like you, you don't know who's in the crowd watching that's trying to get a band going, and now they you've just exposed them to this dude. Yeah. So as soon as he gets off stage, he he's getting bombarded. Like, hey, man, you're really good. Uh, we're putting together something. We need to get together. And 
I love that stuff. Yeah, it was a great experience. We really, and I got this from feedback from many people how, you know, we help we help people through divorces. You know, we help people get through some hard times. Someone, a, a good friends of ours, they proposed on stage at Fast Eddie's one night. <laughs> I, you know, it was something that that um, it meant a lot to me to be a part of that band. Is that was where, you know, I'd already been living in Evansville for eight years or so, and and it would. It, it, it was great. It was a great opportunity that I'm forever thankful for, and getting to play places that now people, you know, don't, don't exist anymore. Yeah, fast we just have eddies. memories of Woody's yeah. and Fast Eddies. Yeah, and, like I know you guys never played the Duck, right? Like that would have been too small of a place. I, I, I didn't, but I did play at the Duck Inn with Monkey Gland. That's another yeah. band that I was yeah. in. Um, Wasn't that? Uh, was Brandon Osborne? In yeah, there? Brandon, yeah, Brandon was on drums. You're talking about a beast of a drunk. He's Good. a wonderful. God, he's a gorilla. He's fantastic. <laughs> he was the reason why I was in that band because I wanted to work with Brandon. <laughs> right. You know, he was great. It still is great. And we, he and I, played together in a band called Homeschool Dropouts. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a joy to work with him. He's one of the best drummers I've ever worked with. You know, yeah. Solid. Knows what and he's, he's doing. And he's fun. And he's fun. He's fun. Yeah. He's ridiculous. Like, okay, getting to the Homeschool Dropouts. You know, I was leading up to that. I love that band. No, I, think so. I, I I love the whole project. I th- I think it's you guys have brought back that fun vibe that Gonzo's Toy Box had. That's what we wanted to do to make it. You know, would, when I first joined the band, it was called Nocturnal. Stuart mm-hmm. Martin was it was his band, and and Stuart was you know into he's more into in, industrial metal. You know, uh, when he left the band though. I we changed direction a little bit, you know. Some of the things that we do are taking uh, '80s pop tunes and rocking them out a little bit, you know. And so yeah. that's that's just, that's gonna that's gonna put a smile on your face, you know. Yeah. So we wanted to be a more fun, you know, guitar or you know, focused band, you know, rock, but um, not uh, angry so much. <laughs> what else? Any any time Andy Mitchell and I get to come see you guys together. <laughs> we love messing with you and Brandon. Like we make Brandon do all kinds of shit to entertain us that you guys don't even see yeah. happening behind you. I, <laughs> but Brandon will just go pure ham just to entertain the two of us. <laughs> and other people are like, what is happening right now? And then, you know, me or Andy coming over and picking up your little floor fan and, you, <laughs> and your hair's just flowing. <laughs> it's good. It's good shit, man. Like, and it's, it's, I think that even people who may not know you, like that are there that don't know you yet, when they see you interacting with people in the crowd like that and having fun, makes it more fun for them. And they're like, I got to come back and see these guys. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, that's one of the things where, you know, like with Gonzo's Toy Box, we played such a diverse, uh, so many, so much different music from mm-hmm. country to, you know, people would. You know, it, it was like the. I thought we were the Jack FM of bar bands. You know, that's a good description. Really, it's yeah. like, oh, you don't like a song? Wait five minutes. Yeah. You know, you don't like rock? <laughs> here's a country thing coming at you. You know, if you don't like country, then here's something. And a big part of that is, you know, Mark Goins was and still is such a voracious consumer of music. We were doing songs that didn't officially drop yet. We were doing the CeeLo Green t- uh, tune, uh, Fuck You, yeah. when it was still an internet thing. Yep. Um, there were a lot of songs, and I keep, we were just really riding that wave. It was really important um, to him and the band to not not be a classic rock band unless Don't you played a song. Yourself. Yeah, yeah. just really stay current and stay on top of it. And Mark was a huge part of that. And also... We never, you know, we had like, I don't know, 80, 80 songs, 80, 90 given, on a given night that we could play. And people ask me, what's on the next set? It's like, I don't know. Well, how do you not know? <laughs> it's because Mark would make a custom set every night, every set for the room, which is fantastic. And he would edit on the fly. Oh, yeah, that like too. Many times you'd see oh, him yeah. put his hand over the mic and be like, no, we're going to skip this one. Let's go yeah. and do this. Do an like, audible. Yep. He, yeah. Yeah. He was very good at reading a crowd. And mm-hmm. he... Very, very good at maintaining momentum. Yeah. Yep. Up until the break. And then I always felt bad for you. In my opinion, the best format that I've seen for any cover band, Velcro Pygmies has it. Those dudes get on stage and they go straight out for two and a half hours. They're so entertaining. Oh, dude, Cam and Cam and Chris 
are just that's that's the heart and soul right there yeah. singer and drummer those yeah. two have been together forever yeah and they are so funny and then you know like angel Depp, everybody that's been in um Jacob Sandbert, Sanders Sandman, uh-huh. rest in peace. Oh man, I miss that dude yeah. a lot. Uh, but everyone just, I think even when they're nervous when they join the band, once they get on stage with them and they realize, oh, I'm here to have fun. Oh, okay. Well, let's get goofy. And then it's just how goofy can we get? And I love them. But that that format of no break, they do not let a DJ have any chance of hijacking the momentum that they build from the moment you hear their intro start to going into poison and looking for nothing (laughs) but a good time yeah and i i always thought i was like man gonzo should have capitalized on that and just done the straight through thing like start later play straight because that would have been something you know that's unfortunate for better or worse the format that's dictated by the clubs you know i mean they they, and it was always remarkable to me like how did i how how was i as current on 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 contemporary you know dance music you know it's like well we're playing a rock band in evansville so i'm hearing everything you know i should be able to do the wobble blindfolded (laughs) (laughs) oh my goodness but yeah, the Velcro Pygmies, those guys are also really, I mean, I've got to, we played it with them a couple of times and really kind, gracious. Yes. You know, you get to a point where, and whether you're, I think, a comedian or an actor, if you've been doing it long enough, then it's because you're not, you're not an asshole. You know, you're, you're a decent human being. You can, you know, meet new people and, and you're secure in your own, in your own shit, you know, and you don't have to be, you know. I mean, I always felt that music was a lesson in humility. And if you're not humbled by the experience of learning an instrument, then then you're not doing it right. That's a failure well, of imagination. Not, e- not even just playing the instrument, e- even being the singer. Like yeah. the, the, the biggest shock for me, like I had been in original bands, a co- you know, here and there. When I joined Paradigm, this is a whole different scale. And I'll never forget you know, they th- when I joined the band, McGuire booked <laughs> booked our first show at the Duck Inn, mm-hmm. and I told him immediately when he said our first show's coming up in January, we're gonna play the Duck Inn, and I was like, "Are you nuts, dude? That's not big enough." And he goes, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "You don't understand how many people <laughs> are going to show up for this." And he goes, "Man, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but <laughs> you know, you know, original music just doesn't really fly like that here." And I was like. Matt, you're not getting what I'm saying, dude. There's going to be people standing outside that building pissed off that they can't get in to see me. Like, they're, they're going to be mad. Like, there's going to be some animosity, and that place is going to be packed inside anyway. And he was like, well, no, man, it's not, you know, I mean, I, I'm glad that you, you're you that hyped up about it. We get there. <laughs> <laughs> Bef- this is an hour before the first band even sets up to take the stage. We could barely move through the building. And I finally catch up to him by the back door as they're loading everything. And I was like, oh, there ain't going to be that many people to show up. He goes, all right, all right. I get it. I was like, did you see all the people standing outside that can't get in? And he goes, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those, like, what really really shook me though was when we started doing those national my third show with paradigm we're opening for skindred uh this is a whole different yeah thing for me now i'm like wait we're what he got, they were like yeah dude we're gonna open for skindred at woody's you know national headliner show and i'm like we are <laughs> and you know once i'm on stage i'm fine 10 minutes before i walk up on stage i am hell it's don't talk to me. Get away from me. I I'm gonna throw up. I can't fucking do this. I don't want to even go up there. I don't want any part of this. And you get up and you do it. And then getting off stage and there, you know, it's one thing to have your friends and stuff coming up. Man, that was badass, dude. Blah, blah. But people you don't know, 
and this is original music. This is music I wrote. Like these are songs I wrote the lyrics to, and I'm singing people I don't know coming up to me. Oh my God, man, that was amazing. You are badass. And I'm like, thanks, man. I'm glad you enjoy it. And I'm like, Oh my God, please get me out of here. Like it's, <laughs> I think that might have been the first spark of real anxiety I ever had. And I had been a pro wrestler. I've stood in front of crowds that had 50 people, and I've stood in front of crowds that were 1,500 to 2,000 people. That shit never fazed me. I don't know why. But being on stage and singing songs that I wrote, and you're just looking for those reactions to see how people are taking it, and... That's what, yeah, I mean, playing in original bands. You know, I was, I've been in two of Matt McGuire's original bands. I don't know if you know. And playing original music, it's a completely different audience. You know, because, you know, when you're playing in cover bands, it's, it's a different audience. You know, it's, it's I mean, That's the places like crowd. Casey's Time Out and Fast Eddie's come to mind. Yeah, you're, you pretty much be, you know, someone's you know, sonic wallpaper for their hookup. Yep. You know, and that's fine. You know, then you have people <laughs> oh that really God. like... <laughs> that is the most perfect description <laughs> I have ever heard of a cover band. <laughs> sonic wallpaper for your hookup. <laughs> I love that. That's... <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's... That's what it is sometimes, I think, oh for some. For some, But I found that, you know, of course, with original music, you know, that's a, that's a different audience entirely. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're so, there with intent. Yeah, yeah. That's that small segment of the population. And they, that, all, they all have that look on their face of, impress me. Oh, they they want to be, yeah. It's rough. It's a man. different it, type it, of experience. You know, they're, they're usually, uh, I think, um, you know, maybe a little bit more savvy as far as, you know, it's not music as entertainment, but they recognize that there potentially could be something really of of, of something meaningful in it. You know, and uh, and it's a different, it's a it's a more, you know, that's that segment of the population that's willing to take a chance on something. You know, they same type of people would probably support independent film, you know, or until original music, and seek it out. And it's great that there are venues for that here in Evansville because um, yeah, it started dying. It was and, yeah. And, and now, yeah, it's starting to come back. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of talent in this town. It's a huge music scene. Yeah. You know? And in and, and, and no way do I think I'm representative of it or even know it all. I mean, I, I get to see a lot of stuff because working in the music store, but um, the Evansville original music scene is diverse. There's a lot of stuff going on. And it's, what else, like Corey Foles, who you work with yeah. at the store? His project that he's got going on with his buddies that he played for me like he handed me his headphones and put him played it from his phone and i was immediately like at first what you know even i know i shouldn't be like this but being in evansville somebody's like yeah man we do originals and i'm like okay yeah i'll listen here plug me in i'll listen to it dude from the first five seconds i immediately took off the headphones i was like this is badass man and he goes you like it and i was like hold on and i put him back on and i'm like oh my god and then as soon as the song was done, I was like, when is this going to be like put up online so I can stream this? And oh, uh, we don't know if we're going to do that. What? <laughs> Why would you tease me like that? Like, I don't need that. Like, <laughs> I wish I hadn't heard it now. <laughs> it's, it's one of those, like, there is so much talent in the Hannah. Hannah Jones. Oh, I'm a huge fan. My. Yeah, Hannah Jones oh. is, is great. She's I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Of, she's a super talented artist and musician, and, and you know, it's a beyond great lady. her beyond her years. Oh yeah, yeah. Intelligent writer. Yeah, like, she's great. She's one of the. You know, I gave her guitar lessons when she was a teenager, <laughs> and you know, she was she. Her dad Steve is a, is a super cool guy. You know, and and always encouraged her. You know, to pursue her art and. And yeah, now and an she's, amazing artist. Yeah, yeah. Like she is multifaceted. That girl is a diamond. Yeah, in the purest sense of the word. Yeah, there's a lot. I, I work. You know, pretty much everyone that you see at More Music. You know, we have some people in the back end of the operation that um, are also musicians. But most of most of my colleagues are working musicians. Yeah. You know, and you and know, they've all got their own thing going on too. Yeah. Like. Like Alan, yeah, and, and his stuff he's got going. Yep. 
it's it's cool like i know i'm on the outside now because i'm you know i'm not affiliated with any band anymore and people have asked me and i've had you know a couple bands reach out hey man would you think about doing this and i'm like mm, i don't know like at this point in my life i kind of want to play my blues guitar stuff and if i eventually think that i'm at a point where i think it's good enough to write some lyrics to and record it and put it online i might do that but other than that you know it's just kind of eh, what well, i'm doing this to entertain myself now and which is the which is the, really the best reason i couldn't tell you how many times people say oh i'm i'm not gonna be a oh you know it's like the weight of being a rock star is invested in this buying this guitar it's like no <laughs> stop it's just like you know do this for yourself because it's it's something that that you enjoy you know if you walked into the doors of more music first of all you had to drive out of your way to get there it's a destination stop we're not in the mall right you know and and so right there that deserves respect i mean we all appreciate that but if you're actually in a guitar shop talking to one of us that's a that's a that's a lot right there. It's like the next step is just you know continue with that inspiration, you know because obviously you love music. It was a song, it was an experience, it was something that got to where you're like, man, I really want to take it to the next level. I love music, you know, and you want to absorb it, make it more part of your life in a in in a more meaningful way, you know. The guitar is a great gateway to do that. And that's how I got into playing guitar. It wasn't from a family of musicians. I love music. Well, so I'm going to give my audience a, a greater depth of you, not even as a salesman, but just as a person. So we have known each other for years. I didn't start coming in to more music until 2018. Okay. Yeah. And I come in and I see you and I actually didn't know that you worked there. <laughs> Did not know. The uh, I had been to the old shop twice and never saw you there. I, I went in both times at the time. Uh, Dennis worked there. Right. And I came to see Dennis, and he helped me out with some things. And, but that was just when I was messing around with guitar. You know, I wasn't taking it seriously. I just needed a few things here and there and whatever. But I come in, and you're showing me some stuff, and we're talking, whatnot. And the third time I come in, now, we didn't discuss any of this, whatever, but the third time I come in, I asked, I was like, okay, Ed, I'm going to tell you something that not a lot of people know, but, you know, like my former bandmates and such. And up to that point, I had never in my life, and this is, I'm at that time, I was 37, 30, no, 30, 39. 39 years old had never touched a fender anything guitar because uh -huh. i did not like them they were not appealing to me just the look i i was just like Ugh, no it's not my style and i don't know if you remember this but i said all right ed convince me on fender and you just looked at me and instantly you said isn't one of your favorite people jimmy hendrix and i was like <laughs> yeah and you were like bulldog come here and you pull down this fender strat pro series olympic white which is one of the main guitars that jimmy played that olympic white strat yeah and you were like here let me get you plugged in and just play this guitar clean for five minutes before you throw on any distortion or anything like that he was like you said uh the one thing that i'll tell you before you start playing a strat is going to expose every mistake you make, yeah. but it will make you a better player. And my immediate reaction was you handed me the butt ugliest guitar I had ever seen. Like of all the colors you could have grabbed, you grabbed this Olympic white, <laughs> plain, just no balls guitar. And then I sat down and I played it. And I was, that was it. I was done. I was like, oh, okay this wow yeah um i love this and then i came in again two weeks later and that's when the monterey hit the wall yeah and as soon as i walked in i just looked at the wall and i was like 
is that the Jimi Hendrix Monterey guitar? And you were like, yeah. And I was like, I don't even want to know how much it is because it's just going to break my heart. <laughs> you were like, just here, let me get it down. And I played it. And that was it, dude. And came back, what, three days later to put the down payment down. And I thought it was going to take me like six months to get it. And I had it out in two weeks. <laughs> dude, I lived off ramen and bologna for the next like three weeks. But it's, that's still, that is, that's my baby. That's my favorite guitar. And here's the odd thing. My other guitars, I have an Epiphone Dot Cherry, and I've got my Gretsch, my orange Gretsch, 5622T. I won't let anybody touch those guitars. But my favorite guitar, that's my Jimi Hendrix Monterey Strat. If somebody asks, can I play your guitar? That's the one I'll hand them. My favorite cool. one that I'm so, like, if, if something happened to it, I'm going to be like, oh, why? But I don't know why that is. Like, I'm, That's a great story. You're sharing the experience. You know, that's one of the things that... That's one of the joys of my job, you know, putting something in somebody's hands and, you know, sharing, sharing that, that joy, sharing that, that, that. But the conversation that we would have had to have had about me loving Hendrix that in depthly would have been years ago, hmm. years yeah. ago. And you pulled that and you were like, isn't one of your favorite people, Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> and I was like, Yeah. You were like, you know, this, the majority of what he played. Like, yeah. And yeah, dude, like you put it like I had already started a little bit on the blues path. When I got that Epiphone dot cherry, that's when I started seriously figuring stuff out. And and then I started coming up with my own riffs and everything that I played for whatever reason, just had this blues sound to it, this outlaw blues. And then that guitar, that Fender just kicked it into overdrive and yeah that's the right guitar i mean it will kick you into overdrive literally it'll it'll, it'll spark it'll spark you to keep playing you know that's the that's that's what i what i feel like i do really best when i can talk to somebody or someone i've known for a while or or someone that just walked in the doors you know just by you know in sales lingo they call it qualifying the customer but you know yeah. it's it's really just getting to know. I mean, my sales philosophy is it is all about personal relationships. And if you can't love everybody, you can't sell anybody. That's 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 a really good analogy for who you are as a person. Well, thank you. I got that from the movie Jerry Maguire. <laughs> so that, <laughs> hey, man, that got that. You're talking the dude that's narrating that the mentor. The whole, yeah, to, yeah, 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 right? through, yeah. But it's true. That's, there's some very valuable lessons in that movie that I think a lot of people missed out on due to the entertainment aspect. Yeah. It's, but yeah, it's such a, I mean, and I couldn't thank you, but I, I mean, I couldn't do the selling hot tubs. I don't care. You right. Know, you know, that's that's why I'm not even, passion. It's down passion, right? Yeah. Yeah, man. So. I think that's a good segue into us leading, you know, out of the, the the shop and getting into more of you as the person you are as passion. And uh, so usually on the show, I, I do try to avoid, you know, political topics and such because you know me well enough to know that I'm just like, oh, God, just the bombardment and on Facebook feed and just from every angle of life. But the one thing I have noticed through any political discourse that i have witnessed online if you're involved you can you have this knack for taking someone who might become or might be the most volatile type of person in those interactions and you have a way of just nullifying animosity out of people and bringing civil discourse out of them and that is just that is one of the biggest testaments to your personality is you can deal with people who are hostile and you can still have a meaningful conversation, convey your points while acknowledging theirs and you bring their hostility level down to match where you're at on a, on a civil plane. And it's, it's kind of incredible to watch. Like even your ability to be diplomatic in text is mind-blowing thank you i i know i'm not always successful but i you some know, people can't be reached yeah you know um, or don't want to be yeah i you know i'm my other passion is is history i've been i've been a student of history really all my adult life say and um 
you know, Aristotle said that man is a political animal, right? Everything is politics. Whether, you know, people say, oh, what is everything? Everything is politics. In a uh, sense, yes. And the reason why man is a political animal is because when you break down the word politics in the prefix poli, polis, that's Greek for city, right? And in the ancient world, anyone that didn't live in the city was not civilized. So one of the hallmarks of civilization is that social interaction, that forced action that, you know, if it's, once you get beyond being a, a, a foraging tribe of people, you know, and, you know, like I think the magic number is like 50. Beyond the number 50, then you can't have, there are no more individual social connections and you have to believe in some kind of construct, whether it's religion, some kind of, you know, uh, implemented law. So, yeah, yeah, things like yeah, that. yeah. So we get into that, that a structure, abstract a structure and order. Yeah, yeah, and um, so you know, I've always been interested in in politics. You know, I did study history and political science and sociology, and 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 I also know that no matter what, I mean, everybody, you know, we're all neighbors. We all have to live together. And when it gets really, really divisive and mean and hateful, you know, I think that, that um, you know, that's something that I've always tried to avoid doing, you know, because in, in, in any kind of argument or in rhetoric, you know, you don't, you're not going to, you're going to lose an argument as soon as you get personal, you know, yes. because it's really about ideas, not the person behind them. And, you know, since, since 2016 and, and the Trump election, there's been, one great thing is I think a lot of people are going to crash course in civics, you know, for better or worse. And uh, so I think now some people we're getting everyone should be get, maybe getting a little bit better at being able to see a a, a bad faith argument from fifty paces, you know. Um, <laughs> yes. And and you know I I do I do engage in politics and social media because really it's one of the only places where you can you know you, you it's in the sense that, you know, we're mostly raised not to discuss politics or religion in the public sphere. So, right. you know, and I think that's relatively new because in my understanding of reading of history, it was different in the past. You know, people read newspapers, you know, people were, you know, the media at the time was the newspaper in the 19th century. People, you know, newspapers have always been partisan. You know, we've always had an editor that, or a newspaper that endorsed one candidate or another, you know. So the idea of this completely non-political media space is really, a, it's ahistorical. It, didn't, it doesn't really reflect the, the reality of the past. And since we don't really study civics in high school anymore... <laughs> And we don't no. discuss politics or religion, and it's kind of looked down upon. And we've, I think, lost the ability to do so in in a way that's meaningful and productive. Yeah, and productive. It it it, it should lead people, to some kind people of people screaming at each other are never going to accomplish anything. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, there was a saying that you know, watching legislation being made is like making watching sausage being made. You know, because. It is about compromise, you know. Hopefully, it's not compromising, you know, Integrity. some founding ideals, right. you know. But, but, you know, there's always been this, you know. That's one of the things, and and we all have to live together. We're all neighbors, you know. Uh, you, you can't go through life hating somebody because, you know, they, it's okay to be disappointed, you know. And if if you have emotions and stuff, but. Hopefully, you're analyzing those in a in a in a critical way. Uh, Around 2005, I really started to get into about 2004. Actually, I really started to get into politics. And by the time 2014 hit, mm -hmm. I had really become turned off to it. What was what, into, what happened in 2004? What was what was was there a moment? Because that's usually what people have. No, it's nothing really. That well, okay. Yeah, um, let's see. Actually, I really, my eyebrows were raised in 2000. I was 21. Okay. My eyebrows got raised by the handling of that election. Oh, you're George, talking about the George contested w. election in Florida and the Supreme. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what? And so I started, 
I started casually, and then in 2001, I moved to Vegas. I start casually researching things. And as I'm researching is when 9-11 happens. And no joke, Ed, three weeks before 9-11 happened, I had just stumbled across the term false flag Mm -hmm. and the things that came with it. And all of these government instituted false flag events throughout history that led us into wars. And I immediately went, what? When I saw 9-11 happen, I was like, "Mm, mm." and at first I was like, okay. And then when building seven came down, like everybody has their opinions and that's fine. But that rubbed me the wrong way because I remember September 10th, Donald Rumsfeld talking about, almost three trillion dollars or whatever it was missing and they from from black budget operations and they they don't know what happened to it they don't know where it is and then the very next day any trace of it is gone get the fuck out of here get that this was a, that was it was a money grab it was a money grab pure and simple and they they there was a sacrifice made to cover trail and Nobody can tell me shit otherwise. Like uh, cave dwellers did not do this. That's that's my stance of it. But anyway, come to two thousand four, uh, George W. was up against John Kerry, mm-hmm. and even that, when I watched, like, I, I, keep in mind, I have never in my life voted in a presidential election. I don't vote. I the only thing that I've ever voted in is local political runs sure like city council things like that I, i've participated in those i've never once voted that's more than most people it's usually the opposite you know yeah. the, no, but I, I think i realized kind of early like before i was 18 and able to vote in a presidential election i was just like i don't think that we matt because i learned you know and when i was in high school we learned what the electoral college was and how these votes were handled and the different caucuses of the states and like how the votes tallied up. And I was like, you know, I learned that one person, one vote, not only did we not implement that here, but I learned how it wouldn't feasibly work because if we did implement one person, one vote, well then basically the entire country gets put to the whim of New York and California. And the whole rest of the country now is subject to whatever the coast deem necessary. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there's. I, I'm familiar with the argument, both arguments for and against it. I think it's interesting that you're able to latch on to your first moment of political awareness as an adult, and I think that is something that would be beneficial for anyone to do. And that type I think, of self reflection are bombarded with this stuff now, and it's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, and it's always it's you know. I mean, when I you know I knew for that's something that that I've asked myself several times. Like I remember for me, my first bit of political awareness was the Iranian hostage crisis. I was in the third grade, and yeah. it just dominated. You know, but as an adult, it was the run up to the first Persian Gulf War. The first the Gulf Iranian War. hostage crisis is is that the that's when they they held the people in that uh, in the building right um yeah the they the who did they have? it was it was start with, I think forget a, the number of Americans that were held hostage that were by, like diplomatic well it was the u s like, embassy yeah yeah, yeah in the Tehran. dignitaries yes yes so the 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 Iranian I revolution don't, happened don't all right and they deposed the Shah of Iran and took over the US embassy and held i want to say 57 Americans hostage in the embassy for a uh, better part of a year and uh for just over a year i believe and that that dominated the adult world and as a kid you know that's when i think nightline was invented <laughs> you know that was when the the modern television evening news magazine you know, debuted. Right. And, and, um, that was something that, you know, I mean, I, I, there was an Iranian kid in my class, you know, there, there was, we, you know, that was something that was, was, was so, uh, uh, 
polarizing for you. It was huge. It was a huge media thing in history, and I remember it in the third grade. And later on, though, as an adult, it was the run-up to the Persian Gulf War. That was something that commanded my attention because one of the scenarios of a, of a possible draft were for young men born in the spring of 1970. And that was me. <laughs> So I really started reading and, you know, discovered investigative journalism and the Village Voice that taught about, you know, that spoke about really what were the underlying push-pull factors with what's happening in that part of the world between Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, the uh, the oil interests, the corporate interests involved, and what United States' stake was in it. And I think if people do think back on their individual moment of political awareness where they really were like, hey... You know, how does this affect me, and why? Why is why is it on my radar? Then, first of all, that's a moment in history that you can reflect on, personal history. You know, within the context of the greater outside world. Yeah, for me, it's the the main one. Like, of course, I caught things as a kid. I remember certain things happening, and but I also remember being a kid and going, eh, don't really care. Yeah. But that election, you know, twenty years ago, dude, that just that still does not sit well and i'm like wow they they stole an election like they and then i started like that's when i really started researching history and i was like oh so lee harvey oswald didn't just act independent like growing up they just teach you that some dude named lee harvey oswald killed president kennedy they don't give you the how or the why or any reasoning. And then if you, you know, you get older and then all of a sudden there's a Kevin Costner movie where he's playing James, Jim Garrison and recreating the whole trial where he exposes all of these things that he uncovered. And it was like, oh, our government took his ass out because he, I mean, the unions were involved in this mess and. It was like, it, like, it was so much more. Like, I just, I remember when I discovered the whole JFK conspiracy thing. Which was for me, like, the original, that was the, def the definition of a conspiracy theory. You know, before, before conspiracy ideation has become part of our national discourse now in politics. Well, now all it the crap's been declassified. Was, and they, the CIA has even admitted involvement. In, oh, yeah, the Warren the, Commission, I think, is still that <laughs> stuff that won't be released for another 50 oh, years or something. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. everyone's going to be good and dead. But, uh, but the JFK stuff, that got released in, like, 20... God, was that 2015, 2016? They, they, they did, like, a, a 2020 thing on it. <laughs> It was like the CIA has, you know, now admitted involvement in the assassination of Chuck. I was like, oh yeah, and then the whole country was like, yeah, we knew that. And I'm like, that's exactly the response they wanted. It's so far past the point, and people knew that it was that way, and now it's just like, yeah, but what are we gonna do about it? And I'm like. Are you insane? In other countries, they rise up and cut people's heads off in the street. <laughs> like well, <this. laughs> well, you know, you look at what's happening in France right, right now. But, um, yeah, you know, people, you know, in positions of power do count on voter apathy. Complacency. Yeah. And, and the, you know, when the Internet first became a thing, you know, it was called, you know, oh, we're entering the information age. All right. And did not realize like really what that actually meant it didn't mean that everyone was going to become you know now well informed you know now it's a much more difficult now it's uh, the age process. of disinformation definitely there are just as many people working against the truth as for it and you get to see that pl that war play out every day online yeah and that's why i think it's important to be aware at least for you as an individual to be honest with all right what are the things that are matter to you you know what you know, to, and and explore what it is it what is it and what are the founding principles of America? You know, do you really agree with all of them? You know, uh, you know. I, I try to explain that to people. I'm like, how much of a student of history are you? Because you know, the people talk about one of my. I think the man should be regarded as a hero, Edward Snowden. That dude tried to save 320 million Americans' lives and tried to release them from a surveillance grip of multiple government and black site agencies 
and the majority of the population turned on him and called him a traitor. And I'm like, tell me your definition of the word traitor, because this entire country that you love was founded by traitors who, if they had lost, would have been either hung or drawn and quartered in public squares. They would have been executed. They were treasonous. They were traitors. They were terrorists. The, like, the colonists, they were terrorists. The tactics that they employed against the British Imperial Army were terror tactics. Well, yeah, the Sons of Liberty did do things that were absolutely, I think, that would fall under that. But those I mean, terms only get thrown depending on which side of the fight you're on. Are you right. on the winning side or the losing side? All right, you're a freedom you're a fighter or you're yeah. a girl. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and and that's why in the in having a foundation of in your own self of what is important to you. You know, because the founders, you know, we talked about these were really high-minded principles that um were radical ideas at the time. You know, of much of our constitution is informed by the 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 confederation of tribes in upstate new york right and in, in, in the in in the north in the northeast you know the native peoples of the northeast had a charter and um when you think about it even the very idea of individual liberty you know for europeans who they were subjects of the crown you know here you need someone a man who's like i'm subject of no one you know you know, my, my charter is between the earth and the sky, you know, and we work together and I'm no one's man. I'm my own. Right. We work together for commonality. Yeah. But that yeah. individual sense of liberty and autonomy is a completely foreign idea to someone who came from a, a you know, gr- a lived monarchy. In a monarchy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Where, you know, like for us, the idea of a king that owns the air in your breath and the <laughs> literal dirt beneath your feet, you know, that's a foreign concept yeah, to us, you know. It's preposterous. Yeah. So, um, and that was much of, of the the way that people, you know, organize themselves for much of human history. And so at that time of, you know, to see, you know, people coming from, from Europe and encountering the native peoples of Eastern North America, uh, you know, there's some pretty radical ideas like individual autonomy and liberty and, and, uh, you know, some that are even still, you know, radical to this day, you know, but the basic founding principles from the Enlightenment thinkers and what the founders were trying to enact in our system of government, government, you know, the idea that, you know, we don't have leaders, you know, we have representatives, you know, the power of the people is invested in these, in, in, in who we elect. And that's what got twisted through the years. That has definitely happened, you know. Um, they, they, they even refer to them in, in, in news bites and all this. You know, our, our government leaders or, you know, our leaders today, but they're not my leaders. These are paid representatives and they're not doing their jobs. And it's one of those like, uh, it feels like you're in a union that you can't opt out of. That's what it feels like now to me. Like... I've, I've been a member of unions and it was one of those where if you wanted to work this job, like I've been in a few places where you could work this job and opt out of the union. You didn't have to pay union dues. You didn't have to be a part of this. You could be an individual, but the United States of America now and the way the government's set up, it, it, it just feels like, no, you're, you're a part of this union, whether you want to be or not. And once you hit a certain age, you better start contributing to it. And it's like, mm, I don't think this is what it was supposed to be. Like, you ever listen to Joe Rogan, or have you ever watched yeah, his stand up? I, I have, and um, it's like you're talking about right to work laws that are really popular in in oh. the Midwest, and especially with country, you know, states with Republican legislators. Um, you know, there's 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 an argument on both sides of it, obviously. And, you know, if you know your history, it's one of the things, the only reason why we have, don't have children working in, you know, factories and mines and eight hour work week and it's because of unions and because of, because of unions and people organizing. And it's because, you know, capitalism is nobody's friend. I'm not advocating for anything else, but the, it's all it is is an well, economic system. Yeah. It's not a, a it doesn't form have of feelings. A societal. Right. Yeah. And it's nobody's friend. So, you know, the, you know, there's a the history. literal word is capitalizing. Like it's you're yeah. capitalizing on opportunity. 
you're, you're seizing it whatever that is yeah it's, whether it's you know human labor you know uh, despite anything so you know there's that's where that exploration of what what are the things that are important to you as an, as a person you know do you feel that you know people's right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness it involves uh having access to health care you know not having to make a choice of not you know buying medicine and food you know what are the things that are important to you do you believe that that america is unique because we have achieved social cohesion through ideas you know and values as opposed to uh um ethnic solidarity or religious solidarity you know there's two competing visions of america happening right now and i think that i think it's fair to say there's three. Oh yeah i think i think you've got that left and right and you've got those people that are just hardcore heels dug in on their side and then you have people like me who walk down the middle of the aisle and be like well i like this idea i'll take that but mm, this doesn't work for me but hey i like this over here but that's a little bit crazy what's wrong with you what leave that alone that's not up to you leave stay out of that but i'll take this and i like this too grocery shopping like people who walk down the middle they're like oh, i like a little bit of this and i like a little bit of this but the majority of what you got you can keep like it's crap see i think what you're arguing for is an idea that left and right is really a false dichotomy all right because the things that people, you know, there are certain social issues that, you know, people are going to disagree on, all right? But most people, we all care about our kids. We all want them to right. do better than we did. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be safe. You know, these are issues that affect everybody, you know, and all over the world. I mean, all over the country, you know, and the things about the, the issues... You, know, you mentioned the Electoral College before, and, and the people, you know, that argue for keeping it the institution, they voice that you're concerned about not having, you know, people a in, voice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, yeah. And you know, the, the the argument for abolishing the Electoral College is that, well, the majority of people in America, the population centers, are in the coasts they're in the major cities and as someone who grew up in a major city uh and has lived now for 20 years in what's called i think the not, the not unkindly the fire over fire over country which i don't like that term at all right you know but the difference is that i had to grow up and and understand that that multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity this is the reality, and that's the reality of the majority of Americans. Oh, absolutely. So when we're trying to, you know, advocate for a vision of America, you know, the I, there's many people, you know, who are conservative and on the right who don't advocate for that, you know. Right, because most people have forgotten or never bothered to learn that the foundation of this country is built on the backs and blood of mostly people of color that and that we're all we're all different you know we're all from different parts of europe that's the thing and there's always been successive waves of immigration you Not know even just europe all over the world all over man. the people world come from everywhere yeah here. i mean here in evansville you know in the 1840s we had a large influx of of, of germans you know and there were people before that and you know the 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 population of Indiana, it's kind of interesting in the sense from what I understand, whereas in other states in our region, it was an east to west uh, population. In Indiana, it was from south to north. So, it, you know, I think that might explain some of the things that, that Indiana is, uh, that's part of Indiana's history that maybe not everyone is aware of or not everyone is comfortable with. I mean, we did have the harshest miscegenation laws in America up until the 19, late 1960s. Yes. So it was against the law for, for interracial marriage. You know, the, the Ku Klux Klan in, in two different points in history came from Indiana. Um, and, and, you know, understanding that. proud things. It's, it's, it's really it's, not. Yeah. But <laughs> it's part of history. And, and we have to know that in order to that's uh, a, have a dialogue about what to do right now. That's a great point, too. This, you can't even call it whitewashing at this point. This, 
this scrubbing of history. Have you seen how high school history books regard the move westward of settlers and the genocide basically of native american people through you know the creation of repeating rifles and things of that nature have you seen some of these things well i, I saw a middle school history book a couple months ago this is one of my friend's kids and there's literally a little blurb on the side of the page that says as you know as european settlers moved westward the native people granted them access to lands and agreed to move what are you teaching these kids you're not doing anyone any favors by lying to them about the history of what this country is or it it's tough it's tough i i am familiar with it i am you know cuz you know there's the textbook publishing industry there's a lot that goes into this but there are basically different history textbooks that are published in Texas and in California and it's become very politicized the teaching of history in America yeah and you know by being a little bit you know there's there's people on on the right and conservatives who argue that we're trying to make young people hate America and by by pointing out that manifest destiny and you know the subjugation of native peoples the genocide you know, the proclamation read to them in Spanish that they couldn't possibly understand. Yes, even earlier. I mean, before America. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. I, I mean, mean, it's 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 crazy. Yeah, and and these are things that that I think are important for us to know, so that we can truly then understand what the greatness of America is. You know, America is the greatest country in the world. I really do believe that that our in terms of opportunity. Well. And, you know, I don't think, I know there's not equality of opportunity, but in terms of, of self-expression, the chance, you know, there, there is some truth to this idea of the American dream. And I think really our strength is in the diversity and the multiculturalism, which a lot of people are on the right or against, you know. And that's what we're talking about, this vision of America, is it's a place that is a melting pot, you know, is it a place that is inclusive of everybody, you know, or is it just a place where you find that you know for individuals that find anything that is other is a threat to them right. you know so we have the perennial war on christmas you know it's manufactured war on christmas so really you know it's there's there if someone really does feel like they're personally under threat their religion you know and then and then that should be explored in a, in a way where it's like, okay, well, well what is what is a, what is a civil rights law that says that if you're in business, you have to bake a cake for everybody that walks in the door that you can't discriminate? How is that in right. impact? And and have that discussion, you know. And one of the main one of the main components of capitalism here in the United States is reserving the right to refuse service to anyone. Well, it's, unless you run afoul of the civil rights legislation. Right. You know, I mean, that's... Which, I mean, here's how I look at that, okay? Like like the bakery that didn't want to bake a cake for a gay wedding because it goes against their principles, beliefs, whatever they have. Are they assholes? Absolutely. However, it's kind of your America. It's your right as an American to be an asshole. It really is. I mean, if you look at look at social media... Look at the laws we've created to protect people to the point of now people don't even have to live in fear of reprisal of a fist in the mouth for really going after someone to their face. If that person punches you, you can sue them. You can sue, sue, sue all day. And it's just one of those kind of, yeah, we do live in a society and things are supposed to progress, but still there has to be accountability. So I look at that as, no, I don't think the government should get involved in the people that didn't want to bake a cake for a gay wedding. However, if their business suffers because of them being assholes, mm, that's on you, asshole. That's kind of the... That's that's my view of it. Like, it's... No one should be forced to do something that they don't want to do. It's like... 
You're, no, I, you, I get you, what you're saying. The laissez-faire capitalism is the argument you're making in the sense that, you know, in a free society, you should be able to, you know, do what you want right. to do pretty much, right? But that's one of the things that I was saying before, like, you know, capitalism is nobody's friend. You know, we do have laws, that anti-discrimination laws in place. Right. And, you know, if you want to operate in the public sphere... And, and right, and this I in agree this, with the in point. this country. Yep. You know, there are laws and the books, and now you can decide. You know, the argument is that it's oppressing your religion. Okay, well then, you know, that's where that tricky. That's where that discussion has to take place. Separation where does of your church. yeah? Where does yep. your individual religious beliefs run afoul of the? ability for other people to be free in america right in this country and you know with the gay baking you know of, of cakes now here's the thing that that's something that you know homosexuality is discriminated against right you know these are american citizens who are pay citizens their, pay their taxes <laughs> they pay their taxes they, yep. and, and they're discriminated against by law in uh, over a dozen states. states yeah <laughs> and there's a lot of effort to make new laws that that uh, that further uh, marginalize them, and so that's where it gets back to like, well, what's your vision of America? Is it really inclusive of everybody? You know, there's a lot of pressure to put, you know, teach the Bible in public schools. The president's talking about that. So, what does that really mean? Do you want to teach the Bible in an academic, objective way? Is that really what you want? That's because, a great question. You know, because that's something that's very mature. Yeah, and young I'm all minds, for that. If we're not if we're not gonna church up the Bible, and you're actually gonna read to these children from the book of Leviticus or Job or Revelation and things of that nature, and you're gonna read this to children, and you're you're gonna explain this in depth to them. Hell yeah, let's do it. Let's see what these kids. Let's see what an eight year old has to say when you tell. Tell him about a woman who lusted after the men who's, who had the genitals the size of donkeys and things of that nature. Let If we're going to do it, you got to do it. But you can't treat it like it's a Sunday school class. And that's that's the thing. It, it's, you know, it, there's, I think, a lack of honesty on the part of people who advocate for that. It's like you're, you're not talking about an objective analysis of a Bronze Age myth. But there's you're, an overabundance of ignorance as well, besides the lack of honesty, because you have people who claim to be something who have no fucking clue what it actually entails. A lot of people say they follow Christ. Very few people are Christ-like. Most of them haven't read the book. They don't actually know the story. I read something, someone had said, like, if you, some people who actually read through the Bible and finish it become atheists. It's the, it, <laughs> I've read it three times. Three times. I am an ordained minister. I gra- when it was still in operation, I graduated from the Las Vegas Bible Institute in 2002, okay, as an atheist, just to get my ordination, yeah. to prove that I could. They found they didn't know until they handed me my certificate, yeah, and then they found out I was an atheist, and they were all shocked. And someone that was in my class said, "But you know more about the Bible than all of us," and I was like, <laughs> "That's why I'm an atheist." It's there is no greater proponent for atheism than the holy bible no yeah i mean and and i am uh you know faith is a huge part of my life faith is a, it's a vastly part of different. everybody's life and 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 there's all kinds of good reasons you know as, as some myself personally i feel like i am a spiritual person i know i've read a lot so you know uh Joseph Campbell made a big impact on me when I was 18, when I saw The Power of Myth, interviews mm-hmm. with Bill Moyers, and I read The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And, you know, the, the, you know, the comparative theology is something that I think does can bring you closer to uh, spiritual enlightenment and awareness. And if that's the goal in religious instruction then I'm all for that. And I think you can do that by comparing and contrasting in order to find similarities, you know, in order to come to a deeper truth. But Well, that's, that's also the point that I've made to people. I'm like, if you would like for the Christian New Testament to be taught in schools, then we also need to have the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata. We need to have all of these other facets brought in and there needs there need to be courses of study also on like astrozorianism things of like the 
space way back. We're talking four to six thousand years ago. People need to know who Ahura Mazda was. Mm -hmm. And they also there needs to be that comparison and contrasting that shows, you know, the in, like the story of Jesus or Yeshua of Nazareth is like the seventeenth or eighteenth incarnation of this exact same layout of a story. There are like seventeen before him. Mm -hmm. that have the almost identical story yes and and that i think it'd be a very very worthwhile thing to teach but i think it's disingenuous because in the advocacy for teaching the bible in public schools it's indoctrination of it's, course it's it is. not an exploration of of spirituality and it goes back to also the recent legislation of wanting to put the phrase in god we trust in public schools you know, as those of us know, that the national motto is actually... 1956 right. is when that was added to our money, and it wasn't added to the Pledge of Allegiance until 1959. Yeah, and this I is for political reasons, and not even for a religious course. reason. So, and the but, 50s were are one of the most ass-backward times of our country. One of, like, when you look at just politics, economy, the overall landscape, we had just gotten out of the worst war in the history of the world, like the history of the modern world, and this country was goofy. Goofy. And then they started doing goofy things. Well, you had the Red Scare. You had the rise of populists like Joe <laughs> yes. McCarthy. You know, nope. um, uh, you know, e pluribus unum. E pluribus unum, that, out of many, one, that's mm. our national motto. That should be painted on schools, I think. You know, to remind people that that's what makes America great, in my opinion. That we have, we other countries around the world achieve social cohesion by being, I mean, we're all French, we're all Polacks, you know, we're all British, you know, we're all, you know, but in America, it's. Are you African American? Are you. Well, that's the this, ideals. There's so it's, many separate yeah, and it's sects the, of America. And it's the and, founding ideals. That is the thing. And that exploration of that, that's something that should be part of the national discourse all the time, not just on an election year. You know, what is it that makes, you know, do you agree with the, with the principles? You know? Well, how many politicians have you seen personally on both sides who not just misrepresent, but grossly do not even know or understand the Constitution of the United States. Well, you know, yes, you know, that's something that even though we don't swear an oath on it to defend the Constitution. <laughs> From you know, all enemies, foreign and domestic. It's, you know, and that's the thing. It's a, and it seems to me that in 2020 America, the majority of threats to American life, the majority of them are domestic, not foreign. You know, well, that's what you know the FBI has been saying for a while. You know, um, and and these are things that 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 unfortunately I don't I think do get kind of lost, uh, especially when it's not politically um, advantageous to call attention to it. You know, because oh, I would consider that disadvantageous. Yeah, like it, it would. It would be destructive to the government if more focus were put by the media, by our mass media here. More focus were to be put on how Congress, the Senate, our government as a whole, not only do they neglect the Constitution, but they outright defy it. And we, as a nation, suffer for it. Yeah, I mean, the, cons the Constitution is in place to protect our rights. You know, it, it, it articulates them. And these people get put into these positions and they make laws that protect them. Well, they're, they're not, they're, who, are, who are they advocating for, right? Who are their constituents? It's the, it's the, the donor class. The billionaire you know, it's, elite class. Yeah, the yeah. people with money. And I think that's why, you know, you learn early on. It's like, well, big corporations, they donate equally to both political parties. You know, once you get to that apex of power, there's really oh, not course. that much of a difference, especially when they're pursuing an economic end and a policy that really doesn't, you know, favor the majority of people, the you know, normal, regular people. Uh, the average Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. You know, we haven't seen income gains, you know, you know, in years. 
And despite how the, well the economy may be doing, most Americans are not invested in the stock market. Nope. You know, we're still having to deal with harsh choices between, you know, what we can do for our kids and how we can eat, if we can be healthy and go to the doctor. Um, those are the things that, that, hey, if we are the richest country in the world and we have all of these resources and there's so much wealth, you know, why is it that I'm struggling to make food stretch out and, you know, after the end of the second week before I get paid again? The fact that there are people in this country like Warren Buffett, who I admire a great deal. Warren Buffett has said for years he is completely in favor of a flat tax across the board. It doesn't matter if you make $10,000 a year or you make $10 billion a year. Everybody pays the same percentage and a lot of these problems go away. He's one of many other billionaires I've heard, you know, that are advocates for a change because they recognize. Bill Gates is one. He's, you know, they. It's interesting though because we're seeing now, you know, we have an election now. You know, Michael Bloomberg, you know, basically has bought his way in. The DNC has changed the rules. The to DNC, him. the DNC, at this point, is the most corrupt comedy club in the United States. Well, it's really like a private corporation. They don't answer to anybody. The Democratic National Committee, just like the Republican National Committee, is they appoint their own heads. They vote for themselves. They have, they have an interest. And but what my point, like the point to what I'm saying is, I have, you watch the Republican National Committee, and regardless of your opinion on their views or whatever, they are for the most part, for for the most part, seemingly extremely organized. And they are very systematic in the things that they choose and things like the people they choose. And, okay, this is what we're going with. Okay. And the DNC seems to be some kind of NFL draft lottery where it's like, wait, okay. So you know that the majority of the people who support your side want this old man with his crazy hair but you're going to try to shit on them again and not give them the person they want so that you, what, purposely lose this election again? That's, at, at what point do you have to wonder if if you are even, if you consider yourself left or a, a, a liberal or a Democrat, however you want to label it, if that's the party you follow, at what point do you look at it and you go, what are these assholes doing? Like why is this why is this side over here on the right? Why are they organized? Why are they together? Even half of them don't even like Trump, but yeah. they're still behind him. Yeah, and it's I, it's no mystery to me. And the fact of the matter is that you know there are there aren't going to be anyone else. There's no one else going to. If you want to be Republican president this year, forget it. <laughs> this you're, you're not you're not going to. They won't allow anyone else to run. And it's because they're much more transparent and honest about their what their ultimate their motives are. Yeah, their objective. The objective yes. is to hold on to power. You know, they don't even have a platform anymore. You know, the, <laughs> they the, don't I need up, one. I grew up in a conservative household, and I feel like I'm familiar with the basic you know ideals of you know small government, right? Family values, you know, the things that are the traditional Republican ideals. And, you know, I don't think the party can claim to have a platform right now. No. You know, they've just been they're just interested in in holding on to and maintaining power, which really makes them a cartel. But which if the you problem, at, if you look at the DNC side, though, it looks like they're trying to call audibles at every, on every play and they're trying to grab that power. Yeah, but they can't. Fit. It's so slippery and they can't hold the ball and they keep fumbling. And it's like. If you would get out of your own damn way, you might have a chance. Well, the Republican Party does not have the problem of trying to be an advocate for <laughs> marginalized people. They don't have a problem trying to institute basic fairness and social justice. They're they're not about that, right? Whereas the Democratic Party, you know, these are people. All of the candidates are running on on platforms and rather issues that 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 were articulated by bernie sanders four years ago and it's the same shit he's been talking about for 40 years you know <laughs> yeah. social justice and issues at least at least he does like bernie kind of pissed me off after the last primaries when hillary 
I guess bought her way in or whatever and Bernie got paid off for the for X and I was like what the hell man but at least Bernie has the solidarity of you can look at what I was doing in the 60s and I'm still saying the same things now as I was saying then yeah and it's like hmm all right I mean at least the dude does have some integrity and principles that he stands on very proudly yeah but the problem is he's a member of a party that not only do they fumble the football, but they are the ones that are seemingly greasing the football so that they can't even hold on to it. Yeah. And it's because it comes down to who is actually, who are any of these politicians advocating for, you know, the donor class, you know, we're seeing class <clears throat> solidarity in the entry of, of amongst billionaires. Right? Oh yeah. And, and you know, you know what the one thing I've seen about being a billionaire they have a big interest in remaining billionaires. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, advocating for, you know, free health care, college tuition. Not in their best interest. You know, no. You know, they, they have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. And that's really what the fight is because the status quo is untenable for most people. You know, too many people, too many Americans are on the, but for the grace of God, go I, health care plan. <laughs> Look. I'm going to be 41 next month. I haven't had insurance since 2010. Yeah. And and people are like, well, just for that fact alone, you should be a staunch Democrat. And I'm like, but should I? Because, I mean, look, I like some of these ideas. Like, I fall under more of that, I guess, if anything, that libertarian mindset of, yes, we do need to minimalize the government, but yes, it still needs involvement in the policies of everyday life that help everyone. Yeah, that's why the government, I mean, that's, there are things that are not profitable for private corporations to do. They have no, because it's, they have no incentive to it. But in order to have a healthy society, we have to make sure that kids go to school, that we have public schools. You know, we have to make sure that, you know, the whole town doesn't burn down. So we have a fire department. We have, you know, people rely on socialism every yeah. day more than they realize. It's a part of it's a part it's, of what and, and it's, you know, it's they just don't like that word because it's yeah demonized. Now, the reason why Trump is president and it's found out is because most people they had a, there was enough people that didn't vote. It oh, was yeah. it was enough people that just said, I, I don't see any point in participating in the process. What I joke about it, but I really do harbor the George Carlin aspect of voting. What he said about it, he goes, essentially, on election day, I'll be doing the same thing that you're all doing. Only when I get done masturbating, I'm going to have a little something to show for it. <laughs> And that, because, like I said, I was young when I learned what the Electoral College was. And I was like, so it really doesn't matter if I show up or not. Literally 320, well, let's let's estimate, what, 130 million adult Mer Americans? Give or take, what, like voter age. Out of 320 million of us, let's say two-thirds. We'll go with that. Okay, so 205, 210 million and change. We'll go with that. Yeah, does that sound all right? Yeah, sure. 210 million people could not show up on the second Tuesday in November or first Tuesday in November of this year. And a winner is still going to be declared one way or another. Yeah. With or without your input and most likely even with everyone going without your input it's going to come down to this this and this from electoral college it's we live in a representative you know a, a, we live in a constitutional republic right yes. it's not it's not direct direct uh, democracy right. you know, we know that and it makes it really easy to have this fatalistic view of the political process but the fact of the matter is that it's what we have and there are vested interests that are counting on you not participating in it. Oh, All the polling doesn't take into account anyone at a 35, right? So, 
you know, you figure who has the most invested in an issue like climate change, all right? You know, my 18-year-old is going to be outliving me, God willing, all right? Anyone alive right now that's over the age of 30 isn't going to see the worst effects of, of, of what's happening with the environment. Right. So, I mean, those who have the most invested in it are the youngest, and those are the ones that really have to participate because they have the most to stand or, you know, to gain or lose. And, you know, all of us have something to gain or lose, you know, particularly now with this particular election, I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, being a, a 40-plus-year-old man that should get a prostate exam. You know, uh, all you know, we're all consumers of healthcare at some point in our lives, either by accident or just by being lucky enough to live long enough. You know, and that's where I would advocate for anybody, even even those of us who know that it's not right, that it's totally unfair. It's still there. There is a lesser of two evils. I do believe that. You know, and what it takes is to continue to be engaged. You know, and to discuss, to talk about it. So that's why you're going to get back to it with social media. You know, if we can discuss these issues in a way where we take into account, first and foremost, we're neighbors. We have to live together. You know, we have to get through this point. And too many people, the, to the neighbor point, too many people spend their time worrying about how much their neighbor has instead of looking the, through the window and making sure that their neighbor's got something. Yeah. Keeping up with the Joneses, right? Mm. It Yeah, it's one of those, like, oh, well, he's got all this and all this. Look through the window and just make sure he's got food on his plate. If people got back to that mentality of, hey, are you good? Do you need anything? I don't have much, but I've got an abundance of this. Yeah. You want to share? I think it's awesome. I think I, I, to, you're making me think of something also that, you know, the fact is America and Americans are the most giving people in the world. No one comes close to our level of philanthropy, you know, and charity. And, and, yeah. charity. and when you thought about, you know, you mentioned, you know, when you think of a but disaster like conditions. Katrina or 9-11, you know, how much money came out and did people come up with? that's just it. There have to be conditions met to hit that major populace attention on this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Okay. One story can go viral about a group of animals being seized from a hoarder, from a hoarding incident, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And everyone around the country will be scrambling to adopt these dogs and cats, whatever it is. Meanwhile, we have these stories break in Evansville every week. And our shelters get overrun and these stories don't go viral. They don't they don't get out on a mass distribution scale. That's what I'm saying. Like there has to be criteria met to pull at those heartstrings. And it's gotta be this hive mind like this is that's the one thing that I despise about humanity the most. If the hive doesn't all agree that this is important well then i guess it's not that important mm. yeah and you know i think maybe because it comes down to what is you know us each of us as individuals what are do we have consistency of principles you know what do we you know what are we actually do, you know doing in our lives that's and, why i call out moral grandstanding and virtue signaling the way i do because i'll see people you know, hey, oh my God, look at this! Oh, we should we should rally around this. We should rally around this. Okay, I agree with you. We should, but here's what's happening in your own yard. This is in your city right now. Well, this is what I'm focused on right now, bro. That's half the country away, man. I mean, that yes, that sucks for them, but this is something you can help with right here, right now. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm focused on. Well, then you're virtue signaling and you're moral grandstanding. That's not, you're either you're either in it or you're not. Like it's one of those, like the thoughts and prayers thing. I I, I get that people love to post that, and I'm like, every time I see thoughts and prayers, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not gonna do anything either. You see it as an empty platitude. Absolutely.
Yeah. And, you know, moral grandstanding or virtue signaling, or these are two phrases that, that I've, I think I've only heard of in the, the past couple of years. Oh, really? I think it's something that is a direct result of, of you know, call out culture and also oh, showing see, some kind of. my radar since like 2008, 2009. Yeah. I, and and I, I get it, you know, because really what it is is calling hypocrisy into light. Because that's basically what we're talking about, you know. How can you care about this and ignore that? Well, you're a hypocrite. That's you know, and you know there there's I'm sure there's validity to that. Where people for one reason or another feel they're empowered, or you know, and then maybe there's people that are just you know they're more like um, political hobbyists, right? And so they're 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 it's just academic to them they don't have anything you know they're not actually participating or doing something you know that's something i think about all the time because you know i went to a couple of meetings and did a march you know over the past couple of years because i re- i recognized that for me this is just academic you know i i i don't have a, a dog i do have a dog in a fight but i'm not like oh you got to vote for this person you know because they're all suspect to me you know, and you anyone know, who wants to be in politics is suspect to me. Well, yeah, and because the system is such that it's geared toward uh, you know accommodating those with money and power, right? So, you know, once I I was I was curious, like, how do you do politics? What do you really do? And that's when I recognized that it really happens on the local level, in the sense where you know, uh, churches, you know, that feed the homeless or, or anyone that does kind of any kind of you know, volunteering, True you know, work. getting something yes. accomplished on the local level so that, you know, if you wanted, if you were someone that was advocating for uh, office hours and, uh, you know, of your of your local representatives and making sure there was a translator there, say you were, you know, a community that didn't speak English as a primary language, making sure that there was someone that was there to advocate for you. Among minorities and the poor, that's where that social and political advocacy really is. Is it's possible to make changes? Right, and it's that's, needed. Right, it's yeah, needed, and yeah. that's where it's getting done. That's where you're doing politics. You know, on the national thing, you know, it's these bigger, grander ideas, and you get that thirty thousand foot view of what's happening. And at that point, then you can decide, like, okay, well, yeah, I have a problem with this president because you know, X, Y, Z, you know, and the problem is you have 320 million people expecting to be heard and recognized. Yeah. And that's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. It, and, it truly is. Like I, I this is another thing. Like, I, I love Joe Rogan. Like despite the comedian, he is very dialed in on, you know, psychology and the inner workings of humans and, one of the things he talks about, he was like, the, being the president is the dumbest job I can think of. He was like, one guy is supposed to be in charge of 320 million people? You can't do that. Nobody can do that job. No one can do that job. Everyone's going to fuck it up. It's too much. Like, it's, and I've, I've read, you know, uh, propositions about, maybe the United States should be divided up into sectors and that there should be, there shouldn't be a president. It should be like an acting council of nine. Like it's gotta be an odd number and there has to be an acting council of the nine districts of the United States of America. And these nine people have to come together and either vote yay or nay against or for things. And you know, they like, 320 million people you know it's it's funny because it has evolved to that i think our system of governance is still still good i think it's still working you know the the reason why i think it's on its dying breath definitely it's you know the thing is in history there's always every generation has had to advocate for what america is right and because there are forces involved that really want to consolidate power throughout history and that's really what 
that's the antithesis of what our system of governance is. Was built There's, on. Yeah, yeah there was no consolidation of power. You have three co-equal branches. They didn't even came up with specifically the word, the president, they, they specifically decided to call the chief executive the president because it was someone someone who just presides over a meeting is he's not the a lobbyist. High, he's it's not a very powerful position the mediator yeah. yeah and so of course and when it first came about it was a civic duty like it was george washington reluctantly accepted becoming president yeah he he was like at first he was almost vehemently against it like whoa sure. what we just fought a war he, against a king yeah Why he we misinterpreted supreme, it yeah. he was like no you're i'm not your ruler like i, I don't want yeah. any part of this and then he and thomas jefferson even furthered this and thomas jefferson said working in any political office should be considered a civic duty mm-hmm. like it should be something that every american realizes like they may need to do like almost like it would like it should have I, i've i've even heard people propose that some you know, maybe politics needs to be like a lottery system and hey man this is your time sorry your number's been called dude you got to do this for the next like so far as you pass this psychological exam and an aptitude test Sorry, man. I know it sucks, but this is your job for the next two to four years, however long the term would be. But and I'm like, you know, it sounds it sounds ludicrous to start, but I'm willing to bet after four or five rounds of it, people would just come to accept it and be like, okay, well, I guess I've got to go be a congressman for two years now, or four years, or however long, you know, those terms were decided upon in a lottery system. Sometimes things are going to work. Sometimes they're not. But when you're done, you're done. You're not running for it. Hell, most of the people that would be there wouldn't want to be there. And those are the people that are going to get shit done the quickest because they don't want to be there. (laughs) If you think about it, the average American having, have you ever watched? uh, Surely you have. Surely you've watched House or congressional meetings on C-SPAN. Sure. Does it not make you want to just jam pencils into your eyeballs sometimes? You're just like, wow, I kind of hope somebody breaks into my house and just dumps a slug into the back of my head right now. Because <laughs> if I had to do that every day, ugh. So just imagine a typical American who did not want to be in the political arena. There's going to be a whole bunch of people like, shut up. Can we just get through this, please? Go ahead, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 you know, we're dealing with a point in history where, you know, our country was was an agrarian society. We've gone through an industrial revolution, and now we're in this this post-industrial age. We're in a tech technology. society. Yeah, yeah. and um, you know, we do have a professional political class, right? Which and they're mostly is lawyer. terrible. They're mostly lawyers. All right? Even worse. And and uh, unfortunately our culture is such that now we don't really place a value on on expertise and and intellectualism it's something that's looked at suspect um unfortunately you know knowing having an idea of, of governance and being able to speak to the issues of the day and having an informed opinion requires reading <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which you know i like, mean i even i will agree for for most people if you if you ask the majority of people hey have you read any good books lately yeah. you're probably going to get an answer if you're a reader if you're an uh, an avid voracious reader of anything yeah. you're going to get an answer that you do not like and you're just going to be like completely turned off by that person just almost immediately like that's yeah and that's one of the things you know what didn't was it the uh you know Benjamin Franklin said all right we have a republic you know as long as we can keep it Right, and yeah, you know that's one of the things I always felt that that if you're really, really proud to be an American and you feel that this liberty that we have and the freedoms we have are something that need to be protected and revered, then it behooves you to understand, to read, to know the issues of the day, to be speak to them, have an opinion of some kind, you know, 
I think that that's really the the most terrifying thing is people who are so disenfranchised that they don't participate in the process. So I hope this coming election you register and you tip, you throw your hat in the ring. You know because one of the things that I recognize as someone you know we're pretty close in age is that it's on, all of a sudden you realize like shit. I'm the adult in the room. <laughs> right. And I, I get that. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've had that very same discussion with, with friends, some who are even younger than me. And they're like, why am I more of an adult than you? And I'm like, because you're choosing to be in this one aspect. Like, I have plenty of informed opinions on the matter, but the informed opinions that I have sway my need to go to a poll and place a vote that I consider to be functionally useless. You see what I'm saying? Like it's, I, I, I'm informed enough and I've studied enough of American politics and the operations therein that it just honestly, for me, for me, like, I, and if you want to go vote in that first Tuesday in November, more power to you. But for me, it seems like a waste of my time. Oh, and believe me. Like, believe me, I know. Because first of all, my vote is going to be cast for somebody like, like if I would have voted four years ago. It would have been Gary Johnson. If I were to vote this year, it's it like I would either write in Tulsi Gabbard or Andrew Yang. And Tulsi Gabbard is an independent, but she, if 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 it were to have played out, she would have probably had to eat a little bit of crow and become Bernie Sanders' running mate for the for the DNC. Yeah, I yeah. know. I know what you mean about feeling. Uh, 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 I guess impotent is in, in a sense, you know, for 20 years I've been voting in Warwick County. So when we talk about the electoral college before, it's the reverse for me, right? Because my vote, you know, is not going to make an impact, you know, but that's part of the process. That's the price we pay. You know, I didn't join the military and, 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 you know, it's an institution that I revere, of course. Um, but it wasn't the path for me. And, the way that I show thanks to those who have sacrificed for the freedoms I enjoy, whether it was a soldier or someone who marched, you know, for the things that as a, as a phenotypically white man, I can just take for granted and expect, you know, I'm going to go exercise. I'm going to, my, my right to vote. Right. And I don't begrudge you for that at all. I don't like, I know that hundreds of millions of, well, Hundred, yeah, hundred million people are gonna go vote. Cool. I'm just not one of them. It's it's for me. I, like I've had these conversations with people talking about like uh, how to fix certain things, like for basic health care for everyone. And I was like, it's real simple, real simple. You put a flat tax of fifteen percent across the board for every private citizen. That's of a working age to make either $10,000 or $10 billion a year. They pay 15% every year. No question asked, not 20, not 25, not 30, 15%. Because once you start including millionaires and billionaires into this, you're going to see a huge influx of income for our country. And that's just the private sector. And then you have corporations. You have companies like Amazon, whose owner is worth a hundred and Fifty billion dollars privately. That's him worth 150 billion. How much is Amazon actually worth? How much do they make a year? They they made like 230 billion dollars in a quarter that they didn't pay any taxes on. Get the fuck out of here with that. You know what you do? You place a flat 20 percent on every corporation. And then I've had people say, "Well, if you do that, then they're just going to pick up their jobs and move to other countries." And I'm like, "Great." And when they do that. You tell them, okay, instead of 20%, now you're going to pay 30% on all of your goods imported into this country. Well, then you're not going to have the stuff. And I'm like, well, good luck to them trying to sell it to the Chinese that they're paying 10 cents on the dollar for to make it. Fuck them. Fuck them. That's, that's where I'm at politically. Like these people that are bought and paid for, not with a vote, but by industry dollars. That's why I consider it useless to vote. Until something happens, and it's going to take it, honestly, for a revolution like that to happen in this country, no one's going to want to hear it, but it's going to take mass violence to achieve that. It's going to take the blood 
of politicians to make that river flow to where we can hit that point because one you know i've i've heard like that whole argument about well they'll just move their their corporations out of america and whenever i say well then they can't sell their goods here unless they pay 10 percent more to make up for that profit increase that they're making paying these people x amount to make it elsewhere and they're like well that won't work why won't it work they want to sell those goods right they want to make that money hmm. guess you're gonna to have to compromise huh it really is that simple well you 15 percent for the private sector 20 percent for corporate america or 30 percent if they want to operate elsewhere and still sell their goods here yeah if they're based in america and they want to operate elsewhere 30 percent yeah you've got this worked out i mean you've thought about this it's policy and that's the thing we we vote on the politicians that we think will enact the policies that but no politicians with. would even entertain the policies that i just laid out well that right specific there. one no and the reason i could see is like because one of the mantras is interfering yeah and interfering with 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 the with the open market you know that's one of the things with tariffs that was like definitely going against you know lots of fair market principles you know and and they're 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 regressive in the sense that we're paying them <laughs> consumers you know we're hurt by this using tariffs to enact trade well, policy but, but is, no that's what i'm saying though is if the corporations have to pay 20 percent of their you know of what they make i mean why do i why do i have to pay almost between 20 and 25 percent why do i have to pay that every year but jeff bezos ain't got to pay shit yeah why yeah that's because and the know, people that are in these positions of power that the vote really doesn't matter because they, they've been bought and paid for they were put into those positions by people who own them. You know, Joe Rogan endorsed Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. right? So, and Sanders has been talking about exactly these kinds of things for 40-something years. So, there may not be, you know, the, the exact mechanism of the flat tax that, that you're proposing uh, on the table, but at least of having somebody... I, I don't think you can honestly say there's nobody that doesn't at least try to address the economic inequality that you're talking about. You know, that's one of the things that Bernie Sanders is doing, and there's reason why he's a threat to the to the status quo, to the donor class. That's why he's looking at getting railroaded again. Um, that's the other, like, I, I went, one of my most popular downloaded episodes was a 30 Minutes of Mayhem where I went on a rant tangent. This is in the first year I did the show. I went on this rant tangent about somebody asked me if you were the president, because it was 2016 when I started the show. Mm. If you were president, what would you do? And I said, this is very simple. I would show up with some very interesting people in tow with me. And I would clean house. I would have tens of thousands well, of well-motivated Americans who are armed to the teeth and I would implement a new regime. And this is what I would say in my first public address. My fellow Americans, what I am proposing to you, and hear me out, I'm going to implement a dictatorship for two years. Not four. If at the end of two years, you don't like, if I don't have at least 80% of the American public on my side for the things that I have done and changed in this country, I will walk away and you can go back to the old way and do it however you want it and then i proceeded to lay out specific things that were really harsh and and some people had some uh, opinions and feelings about it and i was like i stand by what i just said and one, one of the big factors was i would immediately go to the senate and congress find out everyone who is invested in any time any kind of corporate ties anything anything of that sort if you have any corporate interest you have 72 hours to handle your business sever all ties and divest otherwise you will be escorted from the premises and you will not be welcomed here if once this clearing happens and new people are implemented into whatever seats if you are found to have any corporate ties you take any money from any corporation for any reason, you will be publicly executed. Once 
twice, maybe three times of that happening, I bet that shit doesn't happen again under my watch. Ever. Ever. That was your most uh, listened to. Oh my segment. God, people were all over it. They were like, man, that's like, and then I even said, and then at the end of the two years, if you liked what I did, I stay for two more. And at the end of my four years, I am done. And this falls on you, the public, to maintain. I walk away and I disappear off into the sunset. I will not be here to guide you. I will not be here to administer any policy. My civic duty has been fulfilled. I was your president slash dictator for either two or four years, and then I'm gone. Hopefully you can maintain the, the groundwork that I just laid for you. <laughs> Water it, nur nurture it, make it grow. And when I started saying that politicians would be publicly executed, I, I even said, I was like, I'm talking CNN, Fox News, MSNBC. These executions would happen in mass public fare. So as to convey the point, this is intolerable. And this is a crime of treason against the entire country for which you will pay for with your life. And they're like, well, that's kind of harsh. And I'm like, if the reality has been laid out for them before, you know perfectly well, if you murder someone, you're most likely going to go to prison for the rest of your life, right? Yeah. You're aware of this. Okay. Well, you also have an inner moral compass that tells you, mm, I probably shouldn't kill people, right? But either way, even if you had the urge to murder someone, you know that there are consequences and actions. So if someone who is in this trusted seat and is supposed to be working in the best interest of 320 million people, they betray that trust, done. There's not a conversation. There's not, it's one of those, it's not a, we think you're doing this. No, it's irrefutable evidence. Here it is, sir. We're going to read you everything that we have that you're involved in right now. And uh, you're going to get a chance to speak. And those are probably going to be your last words. And draw the curtain. Yeah, I get, I get it. I could see why that was such a popular uh, podcast, too. And because the type of populism that, that you're kind of describing through your actions is something that has happened multiple times in American history. The problem is the people who gained those seats of power didn't want to relinquish them. That's that's really the, like the thing. Like Caesar, you know, there are yeah. countless others, and that's the problem. But me, I wouldn't want to be there in the first place. <laughs> like I said about having average Joes in there, and every State of the Union address that I would hold, people would just tell that I have such contempt for the fact that I even have to be here to do this. Be like, look, I want to play video games. I want to play my guitars. I want to be left the fuck alone. But I got to babysit all of you assholes because you let it become this. So here I am. Ask your questions. <laughs> Everybody has free reign of questions for the next hour. And I'll stand here and answer your shit. Like that. And I would have no problem with scrutiny, opposition, I, I'm not that kind of guy. Like somebody could flat out come up and be like, I think you are just a worthless asshole. And I'll be like, be sure to cast that on your vote here at the end of my two years. And if, if I hit 79%, I walk away, dude, I walk away. If I'm at 80% or higher though, you get me for two more years, but then I'm gone. So <laughs> pros and cons, bro. Pros and cons. <laughs> and it, and when I said that I would show up with, a group of very interesting people. That's why. Is because, yes, I would have my own militia to enact this. Like, here we go, boys. This is it. This is this is Bulldogs military. And we're here right now. We're not overseas. We're not stationed in other countries. Here we are. We're in Washington, D.C. We're reclaiming the house. This is ours. If you want to be a part of it, make amends. You have a vision. You're being given. You're being given more than a fair chance. You get to keep whatever money you happen to make during your years of corruption. Good for you. You get grandfathered in, but now you no longer have those ties. And if you made hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, you don't need them anyway. 
you have enough money that your great grandchildren are never going to be concerned about it. So your plight matters not to me. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you, man. I mean, I could never be an advocate for authoritarianism even on a two-year uh, time frame. And I don't like it either, but I, I, I view it. That's the problem, though, being able to trust someone who could be put in that position. Right, because, of course, we know what happens with power and absolute right. power, right? Uh, I still think that you might give a shot, you know, at... Uh, the democratic process before you have to go to, to that <laughs> you know and you've got an opportunity you're gonna convince to me up. to go vote this year and i'm gonna get pissed off after the election results come in and i'm gonna start rallying people i'm gonna be like people look <laughs> here's the game plan these I, assholes don't want to listen <laughs> i do i do you know because you're definitely i think above average probably when it comes to being engaged in the political process at least knowing what's going on and you know it would be a shame for you to not to participate in it you know because yeah i get it you know it's 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 you know but it's part it's a process because the that's what also tears me is the way i view senate congress president vice president you know i view those as civic duties and i do view voting as a civic duty it's just one that i refuse to comply with yeah and that's because and I, I my justification for that is because the people who are put into these positions it's it's voting between a few different bowls of shit and just deciding which one is not as stinky as the other i think it, in the past and there are times that it's been like that but i think now it's different i think it's a false equivalency to like say Bloom, that they're like both you just said Bloomberg was able to buy his way in exactly that's crazy exactly you know but <laughs> Trump's not going anywhere I'm just going to let everybody know right now in February of 2020 President Donald J Trump is going to remain President Donald J Trump for the next four years you know there's a even it's, yeah there's a real real possibility of it, of of it people from, people I know that don't live in America. You know, but finally say, they asked me, do you think it's possibly can be elected again? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely can be elected again. Or what also could happen is that it can be a contested election, like what you're talking about in 2004, or if it's just some kind of voter irregularity, whether it's real or not, you know. Like what just happened with the Iowa caucus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The world? And see, that's the other thing that irritates the shit out of me, Ed. I see these articles get posted. And I know it's clickbait. I know it is. I know it. And I don't want to be interested in it. And I don't want to click it. And I can't help myself. And I click it. And then it makes me 10 times more pissed off than what I was before I clicked it just from reading the damn clickbait title and the, the what it put into my brain. And then it just solidified it and it made it 10 times worse. And then I'm like, God, I just, just burn the whole thing down. Let's start over. Just burn the whole damn thing down. That mental that that sentiment is is I think reason how Donald Trump became president of the United States, you know, because it wasn't because he was qualified or right. The dude you know, was a, he was it a was developer. It was, it was the burn it down. No political, yeah, it was the burn it down mentality, which for you know, the for the unheard masses. Yeah, <laughs> and you know the thing is is that democracies historically do slide toward authoritarianism. You know, it's happened in the past. It's happening right now around the world. And, and every time that happens, eventually it slides into every... Okay, the average of the empires is 300 years. That's all the average empire lasts. Now, sure, you have the Ottoman. You have a few oddities that survived a thousand years or, you know, almost a millennia. You know what I mean? Like several hundreds of years. 300 years is the average. We're approaching that rapidly. Yeah, if you view America as, as an empire. It is. It, that's what it is. It, it, it's just another empire. And it will fall eventually. Eventually it will slide to a point of, right now, this is how I, this is how I explain it to most people. People say, well, how is anyone going to do anything about it? And I'm like, the reason you have that mentality is because you still have your comforts. We have the ability to just get on here and be distracted by whatever and we've 
you know, I got a roof over my head. I can feed myself. I can take care of myself. We have our comforts. What you need to look at is the countries where the comforts go away. And then what happens? They chase their leaders down in the street and they sodomize him with AK-47s and all kinds of things like that. Isn't that Muammar Gaddafi? Isn't that, wasn't he chased down in the street and was sodomized by his people? Like, that dude was, which, I mean, you can't say he didn't deserve it, but that dude met a brutal end. And how many empires have met brutal ends? Most of them. I mean, that's... <laughs> Look at the British Empire. Mm -hmm. The British Empire now consists of Buckingham Palace and a condo in the Canary Islands. No, I know what you mean. The British Empire. And believe me, I know what you mean. I do agree. You know, American imperialism is a real thing. All right. Uh, We do still have a representative democracy, and it has weathered, you know, some pretty intense tests in the past. And I think that this one right now is one of those major ones with what's coming up in this upcoming election. I'm pretty sure at this point you could put a chimpanzee in the Oval Office and it's not, people are just going to be like, well, this is what we've come to. Well, some would argue that we already have one in the the Oval Office. (laughs) Here's the other thing that, okay, as a child, I was fascinated by Donald Trump. I've studied Donald Trump for years. Like, I I grew up in the 80s -hmm. and the 90s. I was fascinated by that man. I just... And I used to watch interviews with him. I remember watching him talk to Oprah Winfrey and Phil Donahue Mm -hmm. and people like this. He's intelligent. I don't know what... I honestly feel like this is a billionaire who ran for president just to show that he could, became president just to show that he could. And I think when he won, (laughs) it's kind of what Joe Rogan said. He was like... Oh no, I really got to do this. Man, oh, this sucks. I don't want to live in that crappy house. Have you seen my house? My house is cool as fuck. I don't want to live in that shitty old house. Like he's just honestly, I think he's entertaining himself at this point at the expense of everyone around him because he just doesn't care. I re- Donald Trump is not a moron. Like, okay, a lot of people thought George W. Bush was a moron. I remember, like, I I lived in Vegas. I remember watching things of Governor Bush from Texas speak at at engagements. And then President Bush. And they were two different people. Two way different people. When George got to Washington, he kicked up the Texan good old boy thing. He didn't act like that when he was the governor of Texas. He was very concise, very deliberate, made very good points. Like he he was a good speaker. And then all of a sudden he becomes president and he says things like, we got a saying in Texas, you you guys might have it here too, but you know, fool me once and and, uh, shame, shame on you and fool me twice and can't get fooled again. These are not the same people. What, what, what's happening here? (laughs) And you know, Donald Trump is is an actor to a point, like he, you know, he, he was a host of an essentially a game show. Yeah, but he, see, Donald Trump is authentically himself. He you know, is, the whole he Bush is clan, extremely you about, egotistical and arrogant. Yes, you talk about but Bush. These are northeasterners, right? Texas, he's not from Texas. He doesn't, uh, you know, he's not that. But he spoke with that right? Texas yeah, accent. Yeah, and everything. yeah, yeah. So he's a consummate politician in that sense. But you know, Donald Trump is authentically himself and always has been. You know, there is no artifice to him. He is exactly who he is showing us he has been since, you know, I grew up with him too. You know, he's inescapable. Yeah, you, you know. were in the city with him. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, but Donald he didn't Trump speak is, ignorantly like that. He always, he was a master speaker. He had an air of arrogance always. Well, you know, he, but, he's a kid, he was a guy from Queens that wanted to get into the New York real estate market, right? And it made him, it was a huge thing for him to do that. And he was self aggrandizing self-promoting, you know, he, he's a, he's, he's a, he's the seller of himself and he's been very successful at a that. elite level professional but, of that. But, you know, when it comes down to, you know, what's required for, you know, 
someone to be president of the United States, you know, I think he's shown that he's just too too gullible and too ignorant. You yes. know, he's not That's gotten... a good ter- he is extremely ignorant of policy and what is required of and even I could admit if if I if I somehow got into that dictatorial role that I just described for you, of course I would be ignorant to a lot of the things that were happening and and you know foreign policy and things like and and how to but but your scenario as a dictator is fueled by a desire to do something to make it better inherently good right right, right? and and i don't i don't see any that type of uh of of uh altruism in donald trump at all no. it's all about making it enriching him that's the pattern you know People are going back and forth about the terms of the the impeachment, and that. it's not like you know this is uh, just what happened in a bubble. You know, it's just a p- couple of years, three years of his presidency. This, you know, the man is consistent. You know, he has a pattern of behavior yes. that you can look back in decades, and he is exactly who he you know who he says he is, and that's part of the appeal for many many people. I understand. I, that's a that's a. What you just hit on there, yeah, the the average American be able, being able to say, I understand and relate to him. Yeah. I can't understand his lifestyle. Like, they can't imagine a day in Donald Trump's life. No. Even non-president Donald no. Trump. You can't begin to fathom. But and that he dude can't pisses imagine, and shits in gold toilets yeah, that and he, cost more than we'll make in a lifetime. And he really can't imagine a day in your life. Right, exactly. Right? So that's the huge disconnect, and that's one of the things where... When, you know, but he did manage to connect with sentim- like the sentimentality of the average American. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know about sentimentality. What he definitely successfully connected with, though, was the sense of fear. All right, the sense of uh, alienation. You know, the fact is, is that yeah, enough Americans have been left behind. And don't that's understand. the sentimentality right there is that the the whole premise of make America great again, you know, he he threw back to the the forties, fifties, and sixties, which again, as I pointed out earlier, mm. was one of the most backward times. However, for people that did live through it, those are the good old days. Well, if you're white, yeah, it over, was a great over time. the age of fifty, you know. Yeah, and that's where his his thing, you know, that's his populist appeal, you know, because that's really, you know, he's 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 not doing anything that's unifying people. No, not at all. And 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 the criticism of his critics is that the divisiveness is stemming not from him and his rhetoric, but from those who would challenge him. Also, I think a lot of the fault falls on all americans in the sense that the majority of this country has become entertainment driven we have a collective attention span of 10 to 20 seconds if you're not entertained in 10 to 20 seconds of a social interaction like scrolling through through facebook you give a video an average of 10 seconds to entertain you and you keep on scrolling if it doesn't you don't allow for a build-up anymore and that's he even even on the opposing side, I, I hear people who just despise him, but they'll admit that he's entertaining. Hmm. They're just like, well, I mean, at least he he's good for laughs every now and then. I'm like, you're conceding a huge thing about our society right now. Like, you're you're showing a big a big tell about america if it were a collective poker player like oh well if you entertain me i can be distracted and that's a i honestly feel that that's and with the younger a lot i I know that a lot of people bitch about kids screen time right Mm -hmm. like they they i hear people say oh i'm trying to you know i limit my kids to being on their tablet for an hour a day i used to 10 years ago agree with that and now, 10 years later, I'm like, why would you do that? Why would you want to limit your child or hinder your child from their potential growth in the world they are growing up in, not the world you grew up in? 
you're doing a disservice to that kid because what world do you think they're going to they're going to be an adult in? They're going to be an adult in a world that's full of screens that they have to interact with, usually multitasking interact with, and you're going to limit them? You're going to put them years behind their competitive peers? Like I get the whole sentiment of, you know, kids need to be outside and playing and blah. Okay, I get that. Sure, I agree with you. However, you you might be doing something to stunt the growth of a young individual in 2020 that was not a thought 20 years ago in the year 2000. Everybody wasn't glued to the screen of their phone because we didn't carry around super-powered computers in our pockets. Now we do. That's the world we live in. And we all collectively agreed to live in that world when everybody started having to have Androids, iPhones, everybody needs to be connected. We all collectively agreed on that world and now people are trying to back out of it. And I'm like, that's not how progress works. You, do, you don't get to, when the train's going 70 miles an hour down the track, you can't just decide, oh, okay, I don't like this train. I want to get off now. That's not how the train works. You got to wait till you get to the next station. Hmm. And by the time you get to the next station, your environment has changed. Yeah, interestingly, in Silicon Valley, those execs are keeping the kids from. I know, I, I've heard this, and I'm like, you know, and it's what ironic. What do you think your kids are going to grow up in? Ironically, in, in education, you know, uh, the more affluently educated children have less screens. You know, they have more real interaction with teachers, smaller class sizes. That's that's and, a huge and in, testament. In, anyway, smaller class sizes, and in less affluent communities, it's reliance more on technology and screens. And 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 I concede to the fact that this is a growth stage right now. Well, no, it's a mass is, experiment. It's a yeah. It's a we've got to find the balance, but you know. If you were limiting your kid to one hour of screen time a day, and meanwhile, Johnny and Timmy are on their phones or tablets the majority of their waking hours, when it comes time for job time, Johnny and Timmy are going to excel in the more technologically advanced fields. They're going to have these tech, like kids that play video games. I remember growing up and they were like, video games are going to rot your brain. Now the kids that played video games growing up are the ones controlling the fighter jets safely in a trailer that's a thousand miles away from the plane they're controlling. That kid that bombed the the Iranian general, the the dude that was co controlling that plane, he's in a little com command center with an Xbox controller, man. Like that dude's playing a game. He's just like, <laughs> doo -doo -doo. later, bitch. Like, get pwned, noob. Yeah, it's. You know, it's just one of those uh, got to find that happy balance. You got to get out of here, man. Yeah, it's been a long day at work. Dude, this is, we've been going almost three hours. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank this, you. This has been a tremendous conversation, man. And I loved getting a little bit of your backstory in there, too, man. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I really wasn't expecting that. And, and I think my listeners are really going to be like, wow, man, he is everything that you described him as. Well, <laughs> Oh, I, no one likes to disappoint, but I do, I do really appreciate, you know, having the opportunity to talk with you and, you know, your listeners are a really broad, diverse group of people and extremely, and, you know, you know, getting, you know, we did touch on politics and history and stuff and, you know, but also I, community. Yeah. And I think that's really, that's the, in, that's the inspiration for me. I hope that if anyone takes anything away, it's that, Hey, this is not like a, a sporting event where if I win, you lose. Right. Because that's not the society I want to live in. Uh, it's not, uh, you know. We, we all either win together or lose together. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I hope that sentiment, you know, informs people's, you know, if they do engage politically with someone that disagrees with them, you know, to keep in mind that, hey, look, you know, we're all in this together. And, you know, if we can agree to disagree amicably, it's way better and more adult than, than, than the alternative, you know, which is bad for everybody. Yeah. Well, Ed, 
thank you so much <laughs> thank you for my coming friend. to do this man this what? is this has been a pleasure thank you very much thank you all this is the bulldog unchained podcast i'm your host king of villains bulldog malenko for ed side and uh this has been a one-on-one session thanks again man thank you